OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Right, very welcome along. It's Tuesday morning. It's OTB AM. We're here with you all the way through until 10. And it's uh, difficult for us to know where to start this morning because what a weekend that was. Uh, we're going to try and cram as much of it in as we can over the next two and a half hours. But if there's anything we miss, then we'll get back to it later in the week. Not to mention the fact that the Champions League is back in action tonight. Uh, so already there is no time for us to take a beat and look back, but only to look forward. Uh, 087-9180-180, that's the WhatsApp number. You can leave a comment in the YouTube stream. Shane is here. Shane, good morning to you. Morning, how are things? Colm is here. Colm, how are you? Jaron, Shane, for the second uh, performance rankings in a row, I think it's fair to say we can go through the omissions before we actually get to it because they're sizable. Uh, they really are. But before all that, a, a slight petition to move all future bank holidays from Mondays to Fridays. Friday bank holidays are the best. Yeah, it turns out they're brilliant. They are, aren't they? 100%. They're way better. The Thursday evening, you can relax, enjoy yourself. What's the story with the Monday thing? Like, what's your what's your campaign for Fridays? Much better, much better. You get the Thursday night, you get the Friday evening, you get the Saturday evening, and then Sunday is a normal Sunday, and you're back to work. And it's like, and the week isn't. Uh, it doesn't feel really long because on Wednesday you're like, oh my god, it's only Wednesday. We've been. I, but how am, about am I, am I wrong about this? What about your a typical Sunday evening? The fear would be. Uh, but this nothing happens. Fear's just transferred to Monday. Then. Nothing happens. I don't think so. And also, fears fears made up. It's like, what are you fearing? Oh, what are you scared it's all, of? It's all made up. Fear and momentum, Jerry, is that it? Well, to, what are you scared of? I think uh, the fear lessens if it's a Monday night but, uh, into a Tuesday morning. Uh, no, no, no. I, just, I think that's... Uh, personally. Uh, what, uh, you, get, you actually get the benefit of I, the end of the week and you feel like the end of the week as opposed to the start of your week starts off really... S- anyway, this is... Uh, uh, you know. What are you scared of is the quote of my morning. Yeah. To get over bank holidays, just on Sunday evening fear. What are you, what are you scared of? There, the Sunday, like there's nothing like having a Monday off when it's a Sunday night and you don't have to go in the next day. It's the best. It's actually not I having having a personally. Friday off well, when, we, we when it's both. a Thursday is much better. It turns out the weekend is actually the weekend as opposed to the start of the week, and it's just this waste. Dead day, dead afternoon, dog day afternoon. You're you're at the bank robbery, making the phone calls. Anyway, what did not make the performance rankings? You were about to list off a lot of stuff. Cork. Well, Cork, I mean, Clare, jeez, like, that was a genuine contender. Um, Then Arsenal hanging on for dear life at Anfield in the end after absolutely hammering Liverpool in the first half. And they were a contender for Amber, but they haven't made it. Shamrock Rovers are back, baby. Mm -hmm. League of Ireland. Cork City had a great win against Dundalk last night to turn this cross. Both are still out of the zone. Another contender. So there, it was plentiful in supply about who could have made this. And then also, the other news is not so much performance rankings related as Leicester City, out of nowhere, appoint Dean Smith. Well, you say overnight. that out of nowhere. Martin O'Neill was in the frame. Mm. So when, you're, when that is your term of reference, Dean Smith, you know, come on down, buddy. Over the weekend, Jesse Marsh is all set to go. Then yesterday, I see Rafa Benitez. I was like, yeah, that would probably work. And I wake up to this to a 5.15 a.m., push notification Dean Smith is in I was um, flicking through I actually can't remember what, which of the weekend days it was uh, but there was championship football on and Dean Smith was sitting on the couch and I was like oh that's what Dean Smith's up to and then next thing it was like no he's back baby mm. so obviously appearing on the sky couch is kind of useful at specific moments when club hierarchies are panicked like oh yeah Dean Smith exists mm-hmm. oh, he'll keep them up will he like they're second for bottom they're in a bit of bother but Bit of a new manager bounce. John Terry and Craig Shakespeare going in as well as coaches. It's, it's going to be interesting. Chelsea could have been in red. Frank Lampard's first game back. Yep. Should have been in red. Insipid, to be honest, but... away to Wolves. Leeds United. Annihilated by Crystal Palace. Leicester City, speaking of. Actually lose to Bournemouth. Lodes and also Burnley all the way back there Friday night. Uh, succeed in their promotion campaign to the Premier League Vincent Company's first job in football he looks like a serious manager with seven games to spare they're promoted to the Premier League and Leinster hammering Leicester Tigers Leicester, none of these people Leicester, none of these teams Leicester didn't make it Leinster didn't make it it's ridiculous I think we're about to see what does make it we're we're anti- Leinster bias in this show yeah <laughs> um, Unai Emery manager of the year uh, I'd say at the moment Eddie Howe slash Mikel Arteta are the front runners naturally enough mm-hmm. but there's a scenario in which you know, Emery is actually the best working manager under the circumstances. And there's also a horrible scenario where he's so good that he ends up getting a Champions League job next season and it's not by taking Villa through. So it's like, 
I hope they just maybe lose a couple of games and end up in the Europa Conference League and we'll all be happy with that and they can build slowly. Mm. You've got to hold on to Emery for dear life, I think. What a job. Yeah. Right, okay. Are we done? Is that it? Too done. many options, too many options. We get into Here's it. what's up between now and 10 o'clock for you this morning. Performance rankings are coming up right this second. Mark Lawrence is going to join us at 5 past 8 to look back on the weekend's football, which was a bit chaotic. Uh, Sarah Dunham is going to join us at uh, 25 minutes past 8. Um trying to think of an analogy for the Limerick Hurlers Terminator 2 that's kind of the best that I could come up with at the moment um, sports news with Colin Lanny Day 45 Mars Brosnan looking back at the weekend's Gaelic football Alan Quinlan at the rugby and a classic you had to be there is Graham Hunters which uh, set the tone it's the early. first ever yeah. and it was absolutely brilliant so uh, at 7.35 it is time for the Gillette Labs performance rankings you know that wasn't an All Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. Boom. Right, we'll just get into it because there's too much here. Mm. We'll start with the red. We'll start in order. We're gonna get, we're gonna go into Rory. Uh, I mean, Jesus Christ, what a disappointment. <laughs> what do you say about Rory at this stage? 72, the open round, you're thinking, well, this is typical Rory at the Masters, he's going to bounce back and shoot a course record and, and maybe get tied for third or something, but it wasn't to be. Shoot the second round, 75, and that was it for Rory McIlroy. 77, I think, wasn't it? Was it 77? Yeah, second round? He was Either way, he did make the cut. Fantastic, yeah. um, so it was disappointing. I mean, when you had four wins in the PGA Tour in the last 10 months, I think the hype rightly was positive going into the, the tournament for Rory McIlroy um, his ninth attempt to complete the career Grand Slam and he's, and he's fallen short once again it's just so disappointing and uh, we, we, will, we will continue to hype him up year on year every single year at the Masters but uh, um, you see that see what, see what we have there Rory McIlroy bested by Rossies that's, that's what our super is I actually think this is true it's a Freudian slip I think it's a Freudian slip. I was thinking about this. He is he is absolutely Mayo. Where when when the deluge of scoring that he's capable of doing comes, it feels absolutely irresistible. But he just can't get over the line in in his holy grail. Obviously, he is very successful. You know, and you would have to say uh, the register of having won all the other majors would prevent this analogy from working perfectly. But I do think there's a bang of Mayo off Roy McIlroy where he's so exciting. He's the one that you want to watch. He's got everything going for him. All the athleticism, all the outrageousness, but just when it comes down to it, at the last second, in the thing that like is now going to be his white whale, he can't get it done. I, the, one of the papers at the weekend was, was talking about him feeling cursed around Augusta, and he must feel a little bit cursed around Augusta, mm. given that, you know, there was the... Was it 2011 when it looked like he was going to win it? Yeah, that was the big choke. Oof. Well, th- you say that was the big choke, but it's been like a it's been death by a thousand chokes since, hasn't it? Yeah, but that was the massive, you know, four-shot lead... Head into the back nine, was it? And, like, I know that uh, flying Bob Rotella in and having the pudding coach there this week, but it did feel like changing the clubs recently was a little bit of a canary in the gold mine. Coal like, mine. I felt like that, all that was good. It felt like all that were all that was... <laughs> I like the changing of the, the phrase. It was fantastic. Um, he's pulled out of the RBC Heritage this week. Uh, which that's, is, new, that's new news this morning, right? Yeah, um, that's yeah, really significant. Because it's the second tournament he's pulled out of. And uh, this PIP programme, Player Impact programme, you can only pull out of one tournament in a year. The fact that he's doing this and possibly taking a financial hit. Kind $20 million dollars is the prize fund there. He got $7.5 million last year for it. So, I mean... It's not it's not small cash that he's missing out on here if he decides to to go ahead with this. Um, no, he made twelve million last year. Twelve off the pip. Oh, twelve off the pip. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was talking pound sterling. Uh, Queen's nose. Um, I I found it interesting in that first round. Um, the did you see the the on course chat he did walking the hole with the the AirPods in the ear? <laughs> um, he's done it before, and other golfers have done it before. He's one of only a few that have tried it, but. These in-round interviews, some people have their views on them. Are they distracting? Nick Faldo, uh, he was asked about it and he said, uh, I was quite shocked that Rory and Max Homa put those AirPods in and did a running commentary. This is the Masters. It's all mental. Uh, about Rory's sports psychologist didn't say, oh, tell the world what you're doing. I don't get it. And he talks about the fact that there's no still photographers in Augusta. They lo- love their tradition. I mean, maybe it's off-putting. It's like a 10-minute phone call, as Rory describes it. Uh, and I know Max Homa spoke about it as well, and, and he was basically saying, it's like being on the phone call for 10 minutes. It's not the end of the world. It might be a shade distracting, but I think if it's 5% distracting and 95% something positive for golf, I can get past that. So we all understand why they're doing it. They're try- obviously competing with the Live Tour at the moment, and the PGA want to try trial new things. Um, 
was that a little distracting moment for Rory McIlroy? Probably not. He, he wasn't going to make the cut regardless. But certainly something Nick Faldo picked up on. Well, it was uh, Gary Murphy talking to our own John there on Saturday after he had missed the cut. And he was just quite simply saying about Rory McIlroy, like the equipment change Jared's mentioned already. But he simply said, like, McIlroy is, is trying to be perfect. He's changing his mm. game for this, and especially the Masters, the one that remains. Is there any sporting comparison to Rory McIlroy's nearly decade-long uh, stint without winning a major? Like for a player so talented, it's Mayo. It's like the the but second won, best team he, of their he, generation, and then they come up against the Dubs, and then the Dubs disappear, and then Tyrone come and just steal it. Well, uh, McIlroy like, has the trophies to show. Like, and I don't think it's quite that comparison. Well, I just think just, the Green Jacket has become the equivalent of yeah. Sam McGuire in this analogy, and it's it's just I I feel like now it's never going to happen. That uh, you know, obviously, you you look at how. Uh, well, Phil Mickelson played in the final round and, you know, McElroy obviously has looked after himself really well and so physically he is going to be able to compete at this level. But there's just something in this where there's something in the air and the build-up to it and we keep talking about how different the approach has been year on year on year on year. He plays before it, he doesn't play before it. He goes on his own, he's telling everybody everything or he's like super laser focused. It's like, he's. Tr- it seems like he's tried everything and so I don't know what's going to drop or change and in the meantime the field is getting bigger and uh, better and more diverse and the next generation of young golfers are coming up and they're able to do everything that he can do well, I, I did say in the show last year I thought Charlie Woods would win a, a Masters before Rory uh, I, was, I was only kind of joking but I mean I don't know if I am joking anymore I do think I do think he will win it honestly um, I, I, ho- so. I hope he does I think obviously he we really hope he does but it has become such a thing like this was the year where he had moral authority. He had confidence. His game was supposed to be okay, and then and then the equipment change definitely made you think a little bit about that. But um, he might do a Tiger twenty nineteen thing where everyone thinks it's way past him. Mm. Even forget about him as a contender, and he wins, and it's one of the great sporting moments. The closest comparison I can think to an individual sports person would be Roger Federer and the French Open, <laughs> and Federer for you know one of the greatest players ever played a game only won it once, and that was a weak year when Rafa Nadal got knocked out early and then Federer had a handy final against Robin Soderling and that was his one and only Roland Garros title and for McIlroy and the Masters is the only thing like a weak field and that people aren't looking at him and is that the one that's going to win that's probably the closest I can think of because it is bizarre and as also Gary Murphy was saying like McIlroy could rock up at the Wells Fargo Championship start of May and win that easily and shoot a 65 you know in round one and a 68 on the Sunday and lift the trophy and the problem is he's just trying to be too perfect and putting himself under too much pressure. He also name-checked last year's champion, Scotty Sheffer, is doing the same thing, that something happens with these players. And it was like Jack Nicholson or, and Tiger Woods said the same thing, was the, they loved the majors in their peak because most of the field choked. So it was yeah. easier to win than standard competitions. The, the, the podcasters and the US broadcasters are also laying into Rory. I was listening to the uh, No Laying Up podcast and Neil Shuster was... was they were basically saying he had no fight. He waved the white flag. Um, they described his power putt in 16. He says, I went back and watched the replay. It was effing awful. It just was. not good golf. Like, I, I, it was gone by that stage. Sorry, is this in the, is this in the second round? Yeah. And like, like it, it had gone by that stage more than likely, but sure. you can't be missing it. And you've got to try and make the cut. And you've got to try and stick around. And you've got to... I, I understand he's heartbroken at that stage. And it's very difficult. And we don't have a clue what's going on. And who knows, maybe there is something else going on and that's why he's pulled out. Who knows? There's a metaphor there with the falling trees. I mean, that kind of summed up his round and that's a point that the lads made as well. It was just, it was just woeful for McIlroy. Understandably, he didn't speak to the media afterwards. I kind of get that after either round. I don't know. It's just tricky. You know, you're talking to the media in the middle of the round, not talking to them at the end of the round. Mm. To the point about the Roger Federer thing, just to go circle back on that, there's never going to be a weak field. That's the problem. There's never going to be a weak field in the golf because there's always like... Uh, Sam Bennett all of a sudden comes out of nowhere as a 23-year-old amateur and he's putting together rounds like that. Like That's the quality of golfer that's coming through from the collegiate scene in America year on yeah. year and they're getting belched into the system and then you've all the rest of them who are, uh, you know, the Live Tour lads are all very well rested, it turns out, mm. uh, and super competitive because, you know, golf's not particularly stressful for those guys and so they can they can work on their game off-Broadway and they can have equipment changes that we're not reading about or interested in yeah. and uh, emerge unscathed the issue there too is in golf you're fully con- in control of your own destiny as well so it, but it, it's the closest I can think of a great sports person who doesn't win 
something so obvious yeah. that they should. You know, should, uh, John Ram, of course, the the story of it. What number fourth Spanish Spaniard to win the the Masters and Phil Mickelson with the final round sixty five. I mean, joined second with Brooks Kepka. It was a brilliant tournament. It was a brilliant Masters. Just a pity that Rory couldn't give us all a little bit more interest. I was wondering when Sunday. in the back nine of Shane Lowry you could do a late surge and someone uh, if a, if a few above him fell away. I was thinking this could be very exciting. Mm. Who do you think will win the Masters first? If they do it all, <laughs> Lowry or McElroy? Oh, uh, I mean, you'd have to say Larry at this stage. <laughs> like he would, you know, if you're if you're pricing that up, yeah. Um, Larry performed really well there last year. Performed well this year, but like afterwards, he said he was on the verge of doing something really great. And I, I, look, you know, I, obviously, you feel really bad for Roy McElroy at this stage, uh, and it has become such a, a public trauma yeah. that we are watching and engaged in by every year watching him talk about no this is going to be my year I can definitely do it I mean look maybe the Irish rugby team at the World Cup maybe that's a better analogy than the Mayo footballers I still think the Mayo one works for me yeah, yeah. let's be having you in the comments mm -hmm. youtube.com forward slash off the ball speaking of Mayo Shane yes, also in the red indeed and I or are they are uh, they are they in the red well, this is not actually good for them <laughs> I was actually thinking that last night. I was like, well, this could potentially... Like, you're probably better off losing now than, than losing in the semi-final to Galway. You have extra two weeks of rest, recuperation. Injuries have been an issue for Mayo over the course of the league as well, and that's not going to be an issue now as they face into, what, five, six weeks of, of a bit of rest and recuperation. Ten points to Ross Commons, 2-8. Uh, pish and rain as well in Casabar, uh, just like it was in 2019 when Ross Common did the same. Perfect ambush, but is it really an ambush? Because Davy Burke was was he was not angry afterwards, but he was like, "Well, why are us common being compared to like a small team? This, this is hardly a a surprise." It was I think he was very aware of the narrative in the week leading up to it. David Brady was on with us last week and talking about Mayo semi final with Galway. Um, hands on head when we were, when we reminded him that Russ Common uh, lay in wait, and we kind of said it last week on the show. We said this this is built up perfectly for us common. Um, you just expect them to come up with a big performance and their their defensive strategy, Brian Stack in particular at the back, I thought was brilliant. Enda Smith was just outrageously good. And then you had a couple of points at the end from Jeremy Murdoch, off the, le the, the one off the left in particular when they broke away. And I think they put them maybe three up towards the end of the game as well. Um, history kind of looked like this result was on the cards because every time Mayo win the league, they tend to lose to Ross Common then, then in the championship. And Jesus, Ross Common love beating Mayo. You could see the reaction from Davy Burke after the match and, and you saw the Ross Common fans as well. Anyone who says that the provincial championships don't matter anymore because of the new structure, just look at how Ross Common reacted. Yes, of course, it's because they beat their neighbours, but um, incredible win for Ross Common. And, and that Galway game now in the Hyde in two weeks is going to be a cracker. See, the temptation here was to put Ross Common in green. Yeah, well, he's a miracle about the job that Davy Burke is doing so far. And Shane, like, he was in with us just before he got going at Ross Common and mm. talked a great game. And was he had so much energy to him. And we were like, this guy, he's so charismatic. You can't take your eyes off him. And he, he, he talks such a good game. But then to back it up with the way he started. Yeah. Like, I don't know what he's doing with those players, but he's getting the best out of them. Well, I said it last week that, that Mayo, 10 of their 14 points in that league final against Galway were from Freeze or Marks. And I know we were making the point, yeah, of course, Marks are essentially from play. They have to work those Marks. But that was something Davy Burke said after the match. We completely targeted that. We were like, we're not going to give away a stupid freeze. Uh, we're going to try and avoid them getting marks as well as we can. Um, and Ross Common just had a strategy that worked. In midfield, Keith, Do uh, Keith Doyle and Linda Smith were brilliant. And those long kickouts seemed to work when they decided every now and again to just pump one, out, pump one in. It was brilliant. Now, the two goals probably changed the game. Mayo had a couple of goal chances themselves in the first 10 minutes. Um, but they were kind of against the grain of how the game went. Referee decisions maybe went against Mayo more so than Russ Common, you could argue, but I think, think the better team won. Um, and game management from Russ Common, they're, they're of course going to waste a little bit of time, you know, go down and stay down. Yeah, and that, that if you're going to play a team like Mayo, that's what you want to do. And I think the conditions played into Russ Common's hands possibly as well. Yeah, I think uh, that was made of the fact that there was a minute of stoppage time in the first half and six at the end of mm. the second half, even though, you know, the conditions... With the wind, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're actually, you know, um, you should get the same amount of stoppage time in both halves. Really, obviously, um, substitutions make a, a difference to that. But um, yeah, look, I think I don't think they were happy about going out, but I do think that it doesn't really matter in the evolution of this Mayo team. Um, are they going to win league and win Connacht and win All Ireland, like, and not lose for the rest of the season? It turns out, obviously, now they're not. But 
Uh, let's just wait and see who they're up against when the draw gets made for the round robin. A game at home, a game in neutral territory, which could well be in Croker, and a game in Croker, right? Yeah, May right. 20th, like that starts. Game, an away game. Away um, game as well, yeah. So, um, but anyone who rules Mayo out of, the, out of, out of all-on contention at this stage is completely ridiculous. I mean, it was just one of those games where the conditions probably played into Roscommon's hands and they, they were up for the fight, Roscommon, you could see from the get-go. Their record at home in these games isn't great and they never seem to put in a good quality performance. It is always by the time they get to Croker that things kick into gear for them. So would you rule Mayo out of a preliminary All-Ireland quarter-final weekend, whatever it's called, wildcard weekend? It's a wildcard weekend. And that game being in Croker and then putting in a good performance and then suddenly... They're up and running by the time the All Ireland quarter final series comes around. I wouldn't. So, but fair play to Ross Common. I think absolutely the story of the weekend. Them and the Clare footballers, like Davies, becoming one of the most interesting and compelling characters in uh, football management at the moment. And you know, that's obviously a fairly big, big beast, uh, or a bunch of big beasts who are uh, bestriding in the game like a colossus. But he's put together a brilliant, brilliant CV, and he's still a very young man. Mm. And uh, yeah, Kildare are definitely looking over there going, oh, great. <laughs> Is what it if? the story of the weekend? It mightn't even be the story of Connacht. Oh, New weekend. York, obviously. I mean, we're going to get to that. Um, Kevin McStay didn't sound too bothered. I still think, I still think really like, in the long run, Roscommon are, you know, there are little little flares in the championship, but Roscommon are going to be a, a long-running beat and they're going to cause somebody in the All-Ireland series a lot of difficulties but, and they're going to give them their fill sorry, of it Roscommon deserves so much more respect than they get and it, it, it seems to happen for all these little, littler counties that start to do really well I mean Roscommon deserve every single modicum of praise that they get and it was their, it was their game they had to go to Castlebar and get a win and they did now they targeted it they had the week's extra rest compared to Mayo as well forget about all of that they were just a better team um, May will bounce back but, but I think we have to give credit for Roscommon and I understand your logic Cullum that maybe Roscommon in the green would give them more credit I am absolutely overwhelmingly getting behind the Roscommon hype train because that Galway match is going to be a cracker I'm definitely going to go to that Galway match because um, another couple of counties that maybe don't like each other sets of fans that don't like each other as well but um, and we spoke about that last week as well the Mayo fans they won't be happy but they'll get plenty more, more days out this summer Who will be the more annoying fans that day Roscommon or Galway? <laughs> Well, I'll go and report back and let you know we'll go to Amber uh, the Irish women's team with uh, could you say a very good 2-0 defeat to the USA ah, let's go with that I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go for it Vera Pau certainly not disappointed afterwards of course the, the unbeaten streak ended um, I mean they don't concede many goals either this this Irish team but there are a lot of positives Marisha Shiva playing off Kara Caruso up front you had McCabe and Payne out wide as well tried something just a little bit different Um but it's, it's positive, and I know they play that second game tonight in St. Louis, Missouri. That's, I think it's half past 12, midnight yeah. Irish time. So Technically tomorrow morning, yeah. Technically. So best of luck to anyone who's, who's deciding to stay up. Uh, Sinead Farley was the story, really. Um, what, 24 hours notice comes into the Irish yeah, squad. and Friday. Ridiculously good. Uh, and, and probably allows, as Vera Pau said, allows Ireland to play that, that different kind of setup with the, the holding striker up front. Uh, Cruz had that goal disallowed for for offside. I heard you asking this morning. You know, did she even touch it? I wasn't sure either myself. Yeah. If she touched it, but but is the argument there that she was interfering with with the goalkeeper? I don't know. Uh, but either way, that goal was given as offside. Um, but it, it's all positive. I think Vera Pau uses the the idea of playing these big teams and friendlies to get used to the World Cup. It tends to work. I mean, you're going to go into the World Cup now not expecting to not be able to compete with any single team. And you're going to come up against Australia and Sam Kerr in the opening game of the World Cup. So, really, really positive. And uh, yeah, Farley with the Calvin father. Yeah. Proud moment. No, it's great build up. Don't mind the unbeaten run. Like, it's, it's actually good that it ended because if they were to lose the first game of the World Cup, then they, God, we haven't lost in such a long time. We don't know what to do with this. And also, you need these games against literally the best team in the world twice in a few days. It's brave and it's the perfect preparation. As you said, Shane Farley coming into the team with 25 years notice, 33 years of age, making her first appearance, and Vera Pau afterwards, and Denise Sullivan capturing the side and her 100th cap for her country. Mm. Pray, full of praise for Valerie's impact. And She's not playing tonight, though. The prob- I honestly think tonight might be shadow boxing. I don't know, but I think the teams will be fully changed. I think I feel like the first game was what they were targeting. Um, I could be wrong, but but I think I think tonight is more so. A I don't think we can go be shadow boxing against America. I, don't, I mean, there might be massive changes, and it might not be our strongest team. But like, um, try some things out, maybe. Yeah. Well, did we did we not try a bit out in terms of the style of play, slightly different? Yeah. An evolution. Um, they've obviously been listening to Koi Gig. 
Hundred percent, but they need they needed that. I think you need to kind of try trial a few new things out of the World Cup. But but we we kind of said, our, is the squad going to take on a few new changes, a few new names? There well, are going to be some girls disappointed, of course. Is Farley in the team? Is she in the squad or in the team? I feel like she has to be in the team now. I mean, really, after this one performance. Well, when you see when you see that performance, if she can play to that high level at the World Cup, which clearly last night she proved she could, or the the weekend, sorry, uh, you put her in the team because she allows. She's just at a different level. She might be 33, but but she's certainly at a level where she can allow the players around her to express themselves and play in different positions. So I'm touching by what her captain or manager said. Yeah, she's definitely a contender for a starting 11 berth, but she's not exactly full of practice recently as well, and she's coming in against the best side of the world, and if she's played that well for an hour, that's all she played. But the ball retention is a big thing, and it's something that Aaron have been criticised for recently, even in the friendly against China. Like they, I think there were four or five passes strung at most together, and it was it was problematic. And like, there's probably too much emphasis on O'Sullivan and Katie McCabe to get us going with the ball. So having a third player in there with equal quality, it will lift everybody else around them and then you get the runners and you get Heather Payne being able to do what she should be doing all the time mm. and crossing that ball in. And yeah, like, <laughs> I was wondering, did, was there a touch? Had Emma Carroll and Kathleen McNamee having uh, different views on whether there was a touch? It doesn't matter, it was offside anyway. But the fact is, Ireland were creating chances and Louise Quinn had a header cleared off the line at nil-nil after 19 minutes. And really the first goal, Emily Fox's 37 minutes you know, long range effort like Courtney Braston probably should be doing better for that. Her footwork wasn't great. And then America's second goal is a penalty that we conceded, like, you know, so and also Braston nearly saves that penalty. So there's a lot of positives positives to take from it. But look, we don't want to settle for a two 0 defeat, but it is against the best team in the world. And it's right ahead of the World Cup. Mm. And there was a bit of football played and chances created. And that's a good sign. And that's why they're in the amber. I uh, should point out as well that the feed got lost, so we didn't actually see the last few minutes of the game if um, if anything major happened. With, with like goal mouth chances at both ends um, I did, there didn't seem to be anyway so uh, that that game is it, it's got a weird kick off time tonight it's like 12.35 yeah, 12, 12, or something 12.30 isn't it 12.30 a.m. 30, 12.30 tonight so we'll talk about the uh, second fixture on tomorrow's show yeah. Kathleen's going to join us and tell us exactly what the, the Koi Gig pod have made of the whole thing there'll be um, they'll be delaying the arrival of this week's pod until the aftermath of that as well so right yeah. uh, on to the green indeed we'll head to the Bronx lads will we 15 points apiece New York against Leitrim 2-0 on penalties one of the worst penalty shootouts you'll ever see but also one of the most dramatic penalty shootouts you'll ever see um, it was quite incredible it probably is the story of the weekend I mean if you look at it uh, a 23rd attempt New York trying to beat Leitrim in the championship and, and they've only gone and done it uh, it was a great quote from one of the players after the match where he, they said even last year when we lost to Sligo the dressing room it was the team has to stay together and that's a trouble that's been trouble for New York over the years that they can't seem to keep a squad together year on year understandably there's going to be a bit of turnover um, but this year they kept the team together they brought in a few new faces um, a couple of Kerry lads as well Brosnan with the, the Kerry father Mikey scoring the winning penalty as well um, Shane Carthy scoring the point to kind of force the game into penalties as well it was just brilliant. Um, and for, for large portions of the game, you're thinking, New York are looking good here. But then you always expect the Leitrim to come back and kind of use their experience to, to get over the line. Um, the, the penalties of themselves were just ridiculously dramatic. And the Leitrim's penalties, I think they'll look back. I don't know if they would have practised them, but looking back now, hindsight's twenty twenty. they maybe could have done with a bit more practice. Two saved, one crossbar, one post. Um, but what a moment. You saw the, the, the images of Larry McCarthy, the GA president, hugging all around him at the on the pitch afterwards. Um, chaotic scenes really there he is so it, like Johnny McGinney will, will forever be remembered I think as the New York manager that, that got it done got them over the line in the championship match and now this Sligo game in, in a couple of weeks can they come to Sligo and get a result you, you'll not you'll not rule them out certainly if they can if they can perform to the standard that they did at the weekend uh, it, it will be quite difficult to come to come across the Atlantic in a couple of weeks and, and, and keep that hype going but if they win they're in Sam Maguire I mean incredible but not a good thing. No, not a good thing for them, but... Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, actually, it's a great story and it's a brilliant, brilliant one-off victory. But if they, if they get into Sam Maguire, they're going to end up being hockeyed by the best teams in the country. And that's, again, not great for the development. Whereas, actually, the, in, they get through to the preliminary quarter-final is that what is of the, of the yeah. Talton Cup, right? They're not going into the round robin of the Talton Cup. Um, but they would go into the round robin of Sam Maguire. When, actually... Maybe they should just get into the round robin of the Talton Cup, and like we should just accept that there's going to be a certain amount of money that has to be given to whatever county is competing against them, and like just let Croke Park pay for that. Like, is there not a way to just help them to benefit from this? But would actually would punish them 
if they were beaten, if they end up beating Sligo. I know. They, I think they want. Like, imagine having those group games. Well, okay. So it's imagine getting that. So it's uh, seven twenty-two. Yeah. To Kerry and six points to New York. Yeah, a great, a great occasion in uh, Tralee or um, Killarney. Well, great, isn't it? It's not great. Yeah, but that's not great. That's that's on the that's on the setup the structure of course it is but uh, but that's not going to stop New York from trying to beat Sligo and get to that stage where they can. Ah, and that's exactly what they should do. I'm just saying that I I think that like, um, you know, oh everybody wants to play in Croke Park and then get absolutely annihilated and it's like oh, that wasn't the experience that I dreamed of when I was in the back garden commentating about scoring the winner. It's like no one dreams of getting absolutely hockey by the Dubs. Yeah, but they probably dream of playing in the Connacht final, which isn't beyond the realms of possibility. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. And um, they play in the Connacht final, and then after that, they get punished for yeah, that. But, but they should just. They should have just, that day. We, if, if they were then going into the round robin, if they were to get to a Connacht final and then into the round robin of the Talchin Cup, where they could actually win two games and have a chance of winning that competition, that would be. And they have a much better chance of winning that competition if they get the extra games in the round robin as opposed to. Anyway, look. Is, is there a universe where they can pull out of the. You know, they can get to the Connacht final and then say, oh, we actually don't want to play in the. The All Ireland series, lads. I, the I mean, isn't what I mean. I don't know. I, <sighs> nah, you go for it, backs against the wall job for seventy minutes, trying to have a respectable scoreline. But like, like if you're talking about hoping to lose matches to save face, then it defeats the whole purpose of sport. Even if it is massively unrealistic, you want to go all the way. Mm. Uh, That's Jack, why they're doing it. Jack Heslin, I should say, for Leitrim was brilliant, and those runs from the back were class. But uh, the the man of the match, Gavin O'Brien, for for New York. And Johnny Glynn as captain as well. They should all hold their heads up high. And I'm sure there was sensational, a of, absolutely delighted for them. Yeah, yeah. bit of celebra- celebrating done, no doubt. But um, can't wait for that game in a couple of weeks' time. But they should definitely soak up this moment. New York deservedly in the green, lads. We'll move on to the next green, the mm-hmm. final green. And uh, I think we're going with Limerick, the juggernauts, the powerhouses that are Limerick. Um, Aaron Glan, superb bit of scoring as well. It's it's it has me at hurling boring, but. Well, this is a good. This is the point, right? When we were the three of us discussing about what's going to be in the performance rankings, and we were like, "Well, we probably should put Limerick in because they are brilliant." Yeah. But there is a bit of like. <sighs> now, having said that, I love nothing more in hurling terms than watching this Limerick side, mm. and particularly Keen Lynch. Just yeah, I, I sorry, I'm, my I'm, often. I'm, there's nothing boring about this whatsoever. I don't think at all. In a competitive I think, sense, Jerry. No? Uh, well, you're just watching absolute greatness, and like the first half, uh, the first half. And we talk about this a little bit later on with Sarah. Like Kilkenny went at them physically and were nasty, and were were as vicious as they could be. And Limerick just soaked it up. Like you're you're watching the evolution of one of the all time great sports teams that Ireland has ever produced. And I certainly am not bored by that. Like again, this is it is just a league, right? Were you bored so, by the Dubs? Were you bored by the Dubs when they were winning their six in a row? Because uh, you, if you were, you're about to be bored by Limerick. I wasn't bored by Dublin Kerry and Dublin Mayo when they went up in the All Ireland. I was I was bored by them and the championship structures, which gave them no games until semi finals and finals. But I, I wasn't bored by them. No, like, like were you bored by Dear McConley? No, were you we, bored I, by Paul Flynn? I I, lo- I can appreciate greatness and and it's fantastic to watch. But it's when they're winning games in you know by by ten, twelve, fifteen. But they points. they they were like it was uh, six points. And Kilkenny had a goal chance with 52, 53 minutes on the clock. And then the ball goes down the far end and Limerick scored and Kilkenny threw the towel in at that point because it is a league game. But like, bear in mind, Clare took them to extra time in the Munster Championship in the Munster Final last year. So everybody's sitting, waiting, watching. They are getting better though. Like the, the kids who were not supposed to be good enough to get into the team or when they were getting in the team, they were only just getting in to put some pressure on the lads. They're actually seizing their opportunity. Mm. And um, so I don't know, I'm not bored by this at all. I think they're absolutely, they should be in the green and we should be like going, this is unbelievable. Tune in every time you get the opportunity to see the Limerick Hurlers this season because this is greatness. There were like ants around the, the Kilkenny puck outs in the second half. Started the second, it was like 20 minutes, was it, where Kilkenny couldn't register a score? You're thinking this is outrageous. Imagine twenty minutes of a hurling match at that level with those yellow slitters where you the team doesn't score. It's Dennis just, Dennis Walsh has a great um, piece today talking about their wides. They've twice as many wides as Kilkenny did. And it seems to be a strategy, it's like we're gonna the team that shoots the most scores the most and yeah. we don't care about our wides. And we're not we're not we don't have any uh psychological reaction. We're not depressed by our wides the way you would be in certainly in Gaelic football. Many teams do get depressed by their wides. They're like, no, no big deal. Quite, uh, they were quite reliant on Billy Drennan's long range freeze as well. Um, 
but then you had TJ Reid sitting on the bench and you're thinking is he going to come off but then the, the game got away from them in the last 15 minutes you're thinking there's no point taking him off the bench at this stage so I understood the decision to leave him there Kyle Hayes and Declan Hannan like weren't even in this Limerick team they were late pullouts so there's more left in Limerick that's what worries me not worries me uh, like th- it is brilliant watching this Limerick team don't get me wrong uh, and they probably will power to another All Ireland this year but it's just in terms of competitive, tight matches. The Munster Championship used to be where it's at, but now if you feel that every game Limerick are in, it's a foregone conclusion in some ways. Now, the teams competing against them won't think that way. Of course they won't. Well, let's wait and see. Yeah. Well, there was a serious reaction to John Dog- Doggan's opinion about hurling, you know, and it's like these days, and he's just not as into it as he used to be, and he referenced like the 1995 All-Iron Final and the, how it was almost like the equivalent of a score if they, they pucked it up the field and got away from danger. But what the way I see it now is that, yeah, they're... Like they're scoring from all distances and the score lines are huge in comparison to what they used to be. But for me, that means just an improved level of accuracy. Like these guys are like professional athletes. Yeah. And like the way they look, the physicality of them and just the quality of pretty much every attempt at goal is either over or nearly, very nearly over. And that like Harding's come a long, long way in terms of quality and Limerick are at the front of that. And you should probably embrace this period, just like we should have embraced Dublin when they were dominant. I think and we did, though, not didn't so we? much. But like when we're saying boring, and like the, you, like it's same with Leinster. It's hard to criticize them. Yeah, it's not their fault. They're so brilliant, and we should enjoy it for what it is. And the rest should catch up, not bring them down. Mm. And maybe it's an era. These eras come and go, but. And maybe you're right. Like it's just when you're sitting there, I'm tuning in to a league final at the weekend, going, "I would love a really tight Limerick and Kenny match here, Parky Cueve, and just a little bit of excitement, drama in the last five ten minutes where it's nip and tuck." But it just it never felt like it was going to be. But this level of dominance is worth it for just in case they have an off day in yeah. the semi final. It's going to be amazing. And then suddenly you're like, oh my God, what happened to them? Hold on, yeah. a Limerick, so a Limerick off day. What's a Limerick off day? Well, they were in a final last year when Kilkenny got close to them, or the Munster final when uh, Clare took them to extra time. Like, we just we have to go back, uh, you know, nine months for them to actually bid in two absolutely epic matches where they've reached new high heights and two other teams managed to get them to go even further than we've seen them go before. Like, that's all you want in sports. Yeah, you, can't have a, you can't have every single week be a 15-course, three-star Michelin meal. Like, you've got to sit through some of these games to get to the point at the end where this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Because otherwise, it's just... Like, yeah, you said they're Terminator 2. Robots don't have off days. Robots are robots. The, the, yeah, they, they're Terminator they, 2 they, lost. Yeah, but he okay. lost in the end. That's the whole point of the movie. Take a bit of oil in them and they'd be grand. Like Limerick on an off day, and someone has said it in the comment as well, even Limerick, that was probably them at 70%. That's what Davey said. Probably only throwing the ball. Or sorry, you'll see the real Limerick in the championship only running at 70% last Sunday. I felt like that as well. They weren't fully at their... Well, let's wait and see what happens. But, but yeah. They're imperfect. They are fallible. And their discipline is questionary. You know, like it is, it, there is a question of it, and they could lose their heads, yeah. And you just never know, and that is going to be worth it. It's sport, you just never know. I'm still excited, I'm still excited, yeah. But deservedly, Limerick in the Green Lads. Uh, okay, that is this week's episode of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette. A reminder, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. Braeburn Coffee is coming to an Apple Green store near you. New Braeburn locations are popping up every month so visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Brayburn to find your nearest Brayburn coffee experience after the break Mark Lawrenson before the break Keith Tracy reacts to Liverpool Arsenal with Stephen Doyle yeah that's the kind of fight if, if your team isn't playing well towards the end of the season that's the kind of fight and character you want to see from your side and especially when Liverpool are still trying to get that final Champions League place because it is fourth place is the, the best they can hope for we've seen them doing rescuing this kind of a situation two seasons ago um, as I mentioned before the commentary they're in the same position same amount of points going into the last 10 games of the season so in a very tricky series of games there look they got beaten by Manchester City but then they go away to Chelsea get a point from them Chelsea were obviously got rid of their manager so the players may be on a bit of a bounce there so they managed to get a point there managed to get a point against the Premier League leaders at home that kind of sets them up nicely going into that last phase of the Premier League season would you give them any chance of making top four? It depends on their away form, Stephen. Their, their, their away form has been so, so poor. When you bring them away from Anfield, the, the intensity drops, the, the quality drops in the final tour an awful lot. Salah's not being as productive as he was. Gakpo, it's not been a bad opening season, but you know he hasn't exactly hit the ground running. Darwin Nunes, you, you might say the same about in terms of goals. 
So look, the away form for me is just big, big question marks. Liverpool are still Liverpool when they're at Anfield, but when you bring them away from there, like it just hasn't been good enough. So still big question marks over their away form, but I think Klopp will just be saying, if we can keep that walk rate, keep that intensity, keep that pressure up until the end of the season, there's every chance we can make the Champions League. But like I say, away from home, big, big question marks about them. OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. OTB GAA. I don't enjoy the game as much as I used to. Hurling? Hurling, yeah, I don't it, enjoy it. it. It just seems to be a lot easier. The chaos is gone. That just complete tension, I think, has gone a little bit out of the game. It's, and goals mean less than they did. And for me, it, if you scored a goal in the all Ireland final in the 80s, 90s, that was generally the winning of the game. Subscribe to the OTB GAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. It's 10 minutes past 8. You're watching OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. I'm delighted to say Mark Lawrence is with us. Mark, good morning to you. How are you? I'm all good, thank you. I'm uh, here in sunny Mallorca at the moment. Oh, it's glorious sunshine. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, will uh, Arsenal be feeling the sun on their backs this morning, having managed to rescue a point from a winning 2 all position against Liverpool, or 2 nil position, or will they be like, ah, oh, uh-oh, here comes the uh, the blue machine to crush us? Um, no, I think if you'd said to uh, Arteta before the game, would you take a point at, at Anfield, I think he would have taken it. Um, he's been there before, obviously he's played for Everton as, exactly as well, so... No, I think I think they take it. I mean, obviously they were they were really good. I was at the game; they were very very good, but very 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 good until, of course, Liverpool's kind of up the ante and started to pressurise them, and then it was completely different. But Liverpool, as as you know, haven't been really like that for the majority of the season. And when you look at their season, I would say to you, which would be for me the two, the two games that. Uh, Catch of the season would have been certainly 7-0 at home against Manchester United. Six, seven days later, 1-0 defeat at Bournemouth. And and that's the way they've been. And um, you just don't know at the moment what performance you're going to get from Liverpool, which is a real worry. And I think certainly that this is the first season under Klopp where the opposition have come to Anfield and kind of thought, look, you know, you can, you can get at these. And that's exactly what's happened, to be honest with you. And um, teams have found it easier to score against them because uh, they've been a little bit all over the place defensively, certainly. There was a moment, Mark, uh, towards the end of the first half and, and, and I was thinking at the time this is this could be a crucial moment and Chris Sutton, I think it was, uh, making the point as well where, where Granit Xhaka um, comes together with Trent Alexander-Arnold just before the end of the first half and gets the Anfield crowd into the game. Before that, it felt like the, the Liverpool home support just wasn't really there. Was that a mistake on Granit Xhaka's part? That it seems that that little coming together and those little off off the ball incidents were certainly getting the uh, the Anfield crowd behind the the home team. Yeah, well, I don't know if you remember, but but last year as well, in the same fixture, um, nothing was nothing was really happening in the game, and and Arteta lost the plot a little bit and started screaming and shouting on the touchline. Had a little go, I think, at uh, at Klopp, and all of a sudden the the cop woke, they woke up. And I think in, I think in the end Liverpool went on to win four, and, and it was a little bit similar. But this this is a different Arsenal now. Um, yes, they're a very 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 good side. We we know all about that, but they've got a little bit of steel about them as well. Um, you know the goalkeeper when needed as well at the weekend was very very good. I mean the save you made very very late on well he made a couple was was outstanding, and they've got this belief. And in fairness to them, even when uh, even when Liverpool were going at them and looking like they were going to score. They they still had opportunities, Arsenal, to actually you know end the game anyway. So there's more about Arsenal this season, and probably there's there's less about Liverpool at the moment. There's those little incidents, and I think Arsenal had had uh, tactics. Certainly, this was brought up as well. The game management. So the twentieth minute, uh, Aaron Ramsdale brings on the physio to look for his eye, and you see all the Arsenal players running over to to get some instructions and a drink off Arteta. It happened later in the first half as well. Uh, Gabriel went down and, and kind of Arsenal used that. It felt like it felt like a ploy and it felt like a tactic and something that was actually planned. I don't know if that's something oh, that maybe is. crops up. Oh, 100%. Absolutely, 100%. And it's very, very frustrating. And it's difficult. It's difficult for the referee because if if all of a sudden they go down and, and stay down, 
then the ref has no other option. You know, he might go say, you know, are you all right or whatever to the player who's injured, and he go, oh no, I've you know I've done this, I've done, and yeah, and it's it, that's crept into football, which for me is it takes away some of the fun about it that uh, all of a sudden teams now realise. I'll tell you the worst star I, I think is 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 um is Newcastle. Newcastle do it all the time now. So I think in regards to, to, to next season, I'm not wanting obviously to, to wish away this season. In in regards to, to the next season, I think that um, the Premier League is going to have to have a little bit of a look at this. Maybe even sort of say, well, I'll tell you what, if you can walk, off you go and the game will go on. And I think that will quickly stop it. But it's, it's generally here all the time now. If you're Arsenal, what do you want... Manchester City's results in the Champions League to be? Do you want them to, to win every game all the way through? and that, yeah. Or do you want them to have a crushing spirit-shocking defeat uh, like a, an all-time classic meltdown against Bayern? No, you want them to keep winning. You want them to keep winning because they're going to have to keep playing. And as we know, it's, it, it's a bit like the Holy Grail for, for Manchester City, the Champions League. They've they come very close. I mean, if you, th- if you think about last season, they should have been, they should have beaten Madrid, um, and the, the amount of chances they had at the Bernabeu, even late in the game as well, they, they should have beaten them. And, and, and that, the moment for, for Pep, it, is the big thing for me. I would say to you now that if if it, if it were possible, if you said to, to to Guardiola, right, you've got a choice: you win the Champions League or you win the Premier League. I think straight away, it hundred percent win the Champions League because, as as I say, that that's the thing that's missing. And I think. Um, I mean, we don't, we never hear from the owners. We don't really see the owners. But if if you are one of the owners, uh, you'd say straight away, yes, please, Champions League. Um, that would probably square the circle for 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 Manchester City as far as they're concerned. Uh, the, the 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 way the fixtures are falling, uh, Liverpool play. Sorry, Arsenal play next Sunday, and uh, City end up playing Saturday evening. Does this matter? Does actually the fact that City are getting to play a little bit before them, does that just add extra pressure? Or is that the type of stuff that we talk about and think about, but actually for the players, it doesn't really matter? It's the latter. Because, you know, you, you, you've, you've still got to win the game. Obviously, they would they would love the fact that maybe, you know, City might fail a little bit, maybe draw or something like that, which, which would be even more incentive. But they, they've got a massive incentive, Arsenal. And... You'd have to say, I, you know, they, they have been the team of the season so far, as far as the, the league's concerned. But I think when when you go out and play, you, you block everything off. Ye- yes, yes, they'll probably watch the match if they can before the game or all those kind of things. But they they they, they will block all that out and on the go. And I, and I think there is there is a there's a difference now about Arsenal. There's a kind of a real steely side to the team. Um, and certainly in the way that they play as well. I mean, the, the, the two wide boys, and you know, um, they're 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 brilliant for them because they they stretch teams and they make the pitch bigger as well for them, which allows them obviously in different circumstances to create all these chances and, and get a little bit more space than they would would have certainly in the last year or so than last season. So, yeah, I think I think I think as a player, you, you just you. you once you go out to play, you blank everything. You don't kind of think, oh, after 25 minutes, oh, it's nil-nil, we're not scoring, we might drop two points. That, that for me, doesn't really happen. I'm curious, Mark, to get your thoughts on Trent Alexander-Arnold. When Liverpool had the ball, he was certainly moving a lot closer to the midfield than, than we've seen him. Uh, kind, of, kind of a la Zinchenko, and it was, it's very much a Pep Guardiola style of play, but Gary Neville's comments on that, um, he wasn't a fan. He said, uh, just looking at Trent in midfield, they've only had two or three days since the Chelsea game, and you're asking someone to do something where you can't have worked on it a lot. We know other teams do it, but you get the feeling that's been planned and worked on, talking about Zinchenko and Man City. What, what did you make of all that? Like... It, Seemed like a ploy that that worked for for large degree uh, portions of the game for Liverpool, but um, clearly Gary Neville's not having it. Oh well, who's, who's worried about Gary Neville? He's going to be the next mayor of Manchester, so it doesn't really matter. Um, listen, I I I, I, th- I thought he was good. I mean, he's listen going forward, he's outstanding. We, we we know he's not great defensively. I thought it worked. I mean, you know, obviously in terms of. The way that he played, then he's, he's much much better in the opponent's half rather than in, rather than his own half. He just he doesn't like and doesn't want to uh, to play kind of defensively. And I think I think it's it's a, a really clever play. It was a really clever play from from uh, from Klopp 
because he's thinking, how do we sort that? Because he's such a good player when he goes forward and he's, he's so constructive for the team that it, I think I think it was really, really good the way that way that he handled it. And the other thing as well is, I think, you know, if, if you're playing in that team and you look you look at Trent and you kind of think, you know, what, what's he best at? Well, he's, he's best at going forward. He's best at being on the ball and, and, and seeing like the big picture, as they call it, and all those kind of things. What's he not good at? He's not particularly good at defending. Well, try and take him out of that a little bit. And people have said, oh, just play him in midfield. But I, I think this this could be the way forward for him, to be quite honest with you, because he just did give them that extra dimension as well. And <clears throat> for the opposition, when players come from those positions, to the full-back area and come and join in, it's very, very difficult for the opposition to pick him up. So it, 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 it was a good ploy. And... Um, whether they do that on a regular basis, obviously we'll we'll, we'll see. I think it's it's Leeds next, isn't it? Leeds away, so we'll see from that point of view whether they're going to continue with it. But I thought I thought he did really really well in that role. Uh, Klopp in the, in the press conference last week had said the elephant in the room is that I'm still here after all the other sackings that had happened. And again, it was this slight change in the way he was talking about this stuff. But I, I put it to you, Mark, that it will be absolutely madness for Liverpool. Uh, to not have Klopp as their manager next season given that if he was available on the market there's no job in the world where the owners of that club would not want him to be the manager you know sometimes you, you forget just how difficult it is to find a world class manager and when you have one if there's a bit of a blip you, you reassess you take your time and you move on together that that uh, it seems from the outside that it would be outrageous for Liverpool to be thinking about replacing Klopp at this stage let me tell you this is is the most important person in the football club. You, you'd sell most of the players before you got rid of Jurgen Klopp. And in fairness to the owners, that they they've been really really good with him. Yes, like any manager, he would always like another you know another hundred million to spend on players as they all do. But no, he's a uh, he's 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 earned the right to decide when he leaves. I think that's probably <clears throat> what I think about him in terms of that. That's the best way I can best way I can kind of put this forward and he's just you know with the season as everybody knows it's, it's, it's not been a particularly good season there are, there are all sorts of reasons and, and it does happen and you know, why do they have all those injuries all those kind of things loss of form etc so no he, he he eventually if he wants to leave he will make that decision actually in fact I think his wife Ula will make the decision because she's she's very much she's very much I think the one who's the driving force behind him um, and apparently, um, everybody says he's met. So she, she, she is the one, basically. Um, so no, I don't, I don't. That's he's not. He's not going to leave. I, I, he's not that kind of person. And you'll say to me, "Well, he did it before, and you know, at Mainz and and uh, Dortmund and all those kind of places." But no, I just, I just think he knows, like everybody knows. And you, you get to Anfield, and I mean, I was, I was there as well at the game on on Sunday. I was talking to quite a few of, of the guys in in one of the lounges. And everybody to a man and a woman were just like, just say, you know, Klopp, they absolutely love him. And at the moment, you know, it's it's not an issue. And I think I think where he's not so much fortunate, but it, it's good for the fact that, that the owners obviously have, have, have sporting franchises. So they understand injuries. They understand uh, loss of form, all, all those kind of things. But generally, you know, at the football club, they, they just leave them alone. Um, and people say, oh, they don't come to the games, they don't do this, but it, it doesn't really matter. He, and he's not bothered about that. As long as, long as he's got their back in, that's absolutely fine. <clears throat> so it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens now in the summer. Um, and they're saying it's going to be a little bit of a re revolving door at the football club. Lots of people out, lots of people in, but it remains to be seen. Getting get rid of players is, is far easier than getting players in and and whether they get the main target, as everybody knows, if they do, it would be like a fantastic boost for, for Klopp and the football club. Uh, Mark, Konstantin Hatsidakis is a name that we, we didn't know before the weekend, but uh, was the linesman, and I'm sure we'll be hearing his name mentioned a few more times over the coming days. He's been pulled off games, um, while the FA, of course, investigate this alleged elbow on, on, on Andy Robertson, and clearly going down the tunnel, Robertson wasn't too uh, too pleased. The argument is that players shouldn't surround the, the linesman. The other argument is that the linesman shouldn't react in the way in which he did. What did you make of the whole incident? Both, both. I mean, you shouldn't. It's what, why? Why would you harangue the linesman anyway? Because 
in in fairness, he's just a bit part player because you know, with with VAR and all those kind of things, lots of lots of his decisions aren't ultimately his decision, are they? Because they can be taken away from him. So you shouldn't surround him. But it, it wasn't it wasn't right in what he's done. It'd be interesting to see what happens because obviously there's the you know the new supremo in charge of a uh, of VAR and the referees etc. But look, you know, and and Andy Robertson's quite fiery anyway, and he. He he was certainly frustrated, but I I mean I as I say I was there and we didn't we didn't really see it because just the position where we were um, they we they'd be sort of gone and then we just heard this kind of kerfuffle commotion call it what you will but it's it's one of those a little bit blown out of proportion is it but, but from Andy Robertson's point of view um, I actually I actually think it's quite funny to be to, to be honest with you because he can be fiery anyway Andy being a being a mad Scot. <laughs> just a little bit uh, final one for me on Liverpool Mark uh, Mo Salah's penalty miss uh, very very similar to the to the miss just left of the post against Bournemouth uh, not so long ago as well is it at the stage now where you take Mo Salah off penalties because clearly the, the resulting in, in Liverpool dropping some seriously seriously valuable points yeah yeah I think you'd, you'd have a chat and say sorry Mo but um, you need to you need to score more from open play yeah you do you, you say look we're gonna we're gonna have someone else, and it, it might be just just what he just what he needs as well because he's he's been um, okay this season, and you, you know what it's like. You know how people put two and two together and make five. Oh, he's got a new contract. He's getting so much money a week, and he's not particularly bothered. He doesn't want to get injured. He's not quite giving all for his team, um, but he's just been going through a, a little bit of a phase where he, he has not been as effective, but. Then you could argue that about the team, that the, the, the rest of the team, very, very few of the players in the team, when you look at them, can say they've had a really good season. Um, and there, for me, lies the problem with Liverpool at the moment, because, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't know. It's like every time they turn up, you don't, it's a toss of a coin. Um, heads, heads are really good and tails, they can be awful, as we've seen latterly. Big win for David Moyes at the weekend, keeps the wolf in the door for another week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, he's been there, seen it. He's done all those kind of things, and he, he knows he knows he's under pressure. But I think he, I think the thing is with him that the owner is only one owner now. Sadly, sadly, the other owner died at, at West Ham, as you know. But um, I think the owner is very, very much behind him. And of course, that they're, they're still in Europe, so um, who knows? Who knows what they'll do? But if you said if you said to me that you know half an hour from this interview that West Ham have sat David Moyes and then you said to me who do you think they should get well it would be David Moyes would it not <laughs> at this stage of the season when you look at uh, all the other uh, clubs desperately trying to find a manager and incapable of hiring anybody uh, absolutely Moyes is um, yeah. one of those people with the experience of what it takes to get out of that so uh, he should be yeah. alright they well, have enough quality compared to the other teams down there yeah <clears throat> excuse me and I think they've got a little bit more steel than, than a lot of the other teams um, so yeah, no, you, you 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 just keep them on. I mean, and you know the fact you mentioned about all all the managers that have left is is if you were if you were owning a football club, <coughs> excuse me, making all the decisions, surely, surely, if you think I'm going to sack the manager, you'd have somebody in place, would you not? Yes. And if if you look at all these these teams at the moment. They obviously just just haven't, and now the latest it's it's obviously there's always a fashion in the Premier League, and the fashion now is is get some get some guys, not just one, a few guys in, just to just to keep you in the league, um, which is very very strange, but now seems to be the kind of trend that every, everybody's doing. Mark, we'll leave it there. Enjoy the sunshine. Thanks a million. Will do. Thank you. It's Mark Lawrence and give us some thoughts on the weekend's football. A uh, reminder: OTBAM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Uh, Powell 74, did Klopp not just need a new scene, a new group of players, a new challenge? I, I don't know. I think the fact that the team is capable of producing the second half performance that they did and the 7-0. Uh, do you remember Antonio Conte came into Chelsea and they weren't in the Champions League and they won the league? Like, mm. if Liverpool are not in the league, in European competition next year or if they're in a conference league where he puts out the, the, um, the Carabao Cup team for that, then I think there's every chance that they're back competing to win the league next season. Like, they don't need radical surgery. They just need everybody to improve their performance by 
a few percentage points, which they've been capable of doing in games. And they do need surgery as well. They, 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 they need the new signings. Yeah, like, but this not, current squad isn't good enough. Well, uh, like how many new signings do they need? Two midfielders, which suddenly eases the pressure on their centre backs. Like uh, Kanata and Van Dijk, if they're fully fit and form a partnership capable of what we think they are, like are the fullbacks really going to get replaced? I'm not sure. Then, then you see the likes of Firmino coming off the bench again to save them, and he's gone at the end of the season. Like there are gaps there. Gakpo Nunes have been good. I think they, they struggled towards the start, but they have certainly come into it. There's still uh, there's a level there that which uh, which they need to get to, but there are, there are gaps, and and Jude Bellingham's not just the only gap, do you know. I I just think that the uh, like the ability for that team to produce the performances that they're capable of, they can do that more consistently next year if they're playing forty important games as opposed to seventy last season and. 45, 50 this year. Like, the, if if they don't have Champions League next year and uh, none of their frontline players play in whatever European competition they're in, then they will still be title contenders if Klopp stays and if Salah stays. It would be a disaster because none of those players want to not be in the Champions League. But uh, they're not getting in the Champions League. Yeah. Well, so we're. we're and, it, win, like, and like it wasn't a disaster for Chelsea, they yeah, won the league. This is the thing. So, uh, yeah, you'd worry. And look, only for the heroics of Aaron Ramsdale in injury time. I mean, you're, t- you're talking about Liverpool winning that game at the weekend. Like, that save from the Salah curling effort that deflects. And then the Canadi one, which, I mean, I don't know how he's missed, but, but then again, he probably had to chest the ball. Um, cracking game. And, and, and it was finally one of those games where we built it up beforehand and it delivered. Everyone was saying this is going to be one of the best games of the season, and it was. Right, the football pod are hitting the road again, heading to Killarney for Off the Ball's first big show of the summer with thanks to AIB. Tommy Rooney, Paddy Andrews, and James O'Donoghue will be bringing the football pod to the Great Southern Hotel for a live episode with special guests on Thursday, the 4th of May. Join us for a brilliant night of football, chat, and crack with plenty of focus on the All Ireland champions Kerry and the contenders who are coming for their throne. It obviously ain't going to be the Cork footballers, but anyway. Uh, this is an exclusive off-air event tickets are limited so don't delay go to offtheball.com forward slash events it's all in partnership with AIB check out the hashtag the toughest for more now we're uh, staying with GA and I'm delighted to say Sarah Donovan joins to talk to us about the um, the hurling final uh, we were, were having a mild disagreement about this earlier uh, Sarah I think that everybody should be watching as much of this Limerick team as possible because far from being boring they're actually finding new and innovative ways to enthrall and entertain us well, I made the decision to sit down inside the 21, uh, the right-hand corner of the stadium for the second half so I could watch Gillan and Flanagan in full flight. And I was not disappointed. If any kid wants to know how to play corner forward, they should be watching Gillan. He was starting his runs, touching the goalpost behind Owen Murphy. And he was making full tilt sprints left and right, those are very brave runs to make as a forward and that's the innovation that you're talking about and I agree with you 100%. Um, what else? Because we can talk about the uh, the overarching and, and where everybody else is and, and kind of ranking the contenders. What else did you notice from the game at the weekend? Um, yeah, I suppose from... Tommy Walsh was talking last week about the aggression and what he was expecting from Kilkenny and how they were going to overturn this Limerick team and... Keane Lynch was left win far too much ball. He wasn't, you know, uh, turned over half enough and he was catalyst for everything that we saw. Um, crucially for me, I suppose, the slow start for Limerick. And look, that's probably not a surprise. Declan Hannan not starting. Kyle Hayes not starting. Dan Morrissey had to go in centre-back. Um, Carl O'Neill did a massive amount of work in that second half. And I think John Kiley, while unhappy with 15 wides in the second half, will be happy with how Carl O'Neill showed up in the second half. Uh, we were talking, Colin brought up earlier a discipline issue. There was an elbow from O'Neill early in the first half to the helmet, which obviously it's uh, to the helmet, so it's, it's, not, it's not seen the same as it would be in if it was football and there was no helmet. Um, is there any little concern that maybe, or do they just iron that out by the time the championship rolls around and like they sit him down and they say, look, we understand that you're trying to prove to us that you deserve your place in the team, but your performance is pretty good at the moment. You're going to be grand. How, how do you balance that out the desire for the aggression and making sure that they don't end up picking up yellows or reds yeah well look we were chatting about William O'Donoghue a couple of weeks ago and we were saying you know you have to be aggressive but you can't be so aggressive that the other man you know, the referee has to make a decision I think is what you said and Will O'Donoghue ended up getting reprimanded you know, the, by the CCC after the game and missed out on Sunday and Barry Murphy then obviously got his opportunity midfield instead I think when you've got a competitive panel like Limerick 
lads, as they make these mistakes and as the cameras show these mistakes up, it's the easiest way to learn, isn't it? You go into training Tuesday night and you try to be less aggressive. I, I was chatting to um, my friend Ian. I brought him to the match. He's South African, right? And uh, he was listening to the Limerick lads behind us. And he turned to me at one stage and he said, what What does your man mean by stand him up? Because there was one Limerick lad just kept roaring, stand him up, stand him up. And I suppose that's what they're looking for is not to foul. These are big, aggressive men. The likes of Garo Tegarty. You can't leave your hands in. You have to stand players up. And, and I think the camera work, the video work, the analysis, that's, that's what they'll be doing over the next few weeks is try to limit the amount of freeze that they give away. Did Kilkenny get the matchups right, Sarah? Because you mentioned Hegarty there. Uh, I think Hugh Lawler was, was picking up Hegarty. Um, Pork Walsh on Galan. And, and for the early portion of the game, it looked to be working. Kilkenny started quite brightly, took Limerick a little bit of time to get into the game. But were those matchups, um, I guess, accurately pinpointed by, by Derek Ling? See, uh, you'd base it off of what the first half looked like and how far up the field the Kilkenny lads were by comparison to how stretched the pitch was in the second half. Like there was one Kilkenny forward inside the 21 for most of the first half, which allowed Limerick to kind of move out in twos and threes and always have a support man to deliver the right ball. In the second half, Kilkenny were pushed right back in. Uh, Flanagan and Gillan were hugging the goal line. At some stages, they were actually sitting behind Owen Murphy and Owen Murphy was walking out because basically the two boys were suffocating him. Um, and I think because of that, it's difficult to say that the matchups worked because where they were compensating, you know, to try and cover off the likes of Garrod Hagerty and the likes of Keane Lynch, it, it gave, there was no pressure on Nicky Quaid. Is is uh, those early starts that I mentioned? Limerick, we saw it against Tipperary as well. I think in the semi final where they maybe don't start games too quickly. Now I'm clutching at straws here to find something that that is maybe ha- half weak about this Limerick team. But those those quick starts in games, teams, you know, if they can bang in a couple of goals early on, maybe that's a way for a team to to target them. But then the Limerick fitness is so strong that ultimately ultimately it's irrelevant. But then teams have to start being brave about, you know, getting turnovers and having a player high enough up the field to be able to turn over a Limerick back. I, I think the the start, Seamus Flanagan scored the first point from play after 16 minutes. And alluding to my friend Ian, uh, the South African, he was sitting there and he was going, God, this I thought this Limerick team were, you know, the, the, the best team in the country. And it, it was just that in those first 10, 11 minutes, they were dropping a lot of ball. The ball wasn't going to hand. They cleaned it up from, what, 15 minutes on, and there was no question after that. But they looked very nervy in the first 15 minutes. It wasn't as clinical and clean-cut as we are used to seeing them, and I suppose that's what they look for over the next two weeks before the Waterford game, is to get those early uh, passes to hand and just and just be more clinical in, in that early phase. That has been a feature, notwithstanding the Ireland final um, last year, where obviously they started like a house on fire. But if you think back to the water breaks and uh, the sense that Knurk had to come on and have a chat with them and just remind them, it feels a little bit now like it's more kind of evolutionary, where the team is almost assessing what the opposition is doing, working out, okay, this is what you're going to do. I understand now what your challenge is going to be. And then they just overwhelm you with the, the quality they have. Can I make the case for Kilkenny actually being relatively happy with what? What happened yesterday? If if we we take it like let's just take it for granted that Limerick are going to be at least five to seven point favourites in every game they play for the rest of the year. If you're Kilkenny, you're getting players finally up to a level of of preparedness and, and fitness um, that they hadn't been at. The Ballyhale players still aren't fully back. Obviously, TJ was on the bench, but Adrian Mullen didn't play the full game, and I suspect when. Uh, these two teams meet again. Adrian Mullen will play every last second of the match, and he'll he'll be back at like full intercounty level of uh, preparedness and fitness. They were savage. They were absolutely savage in the tackle in the first half to the point where they could have had many bookings themselves more, but the referee allowed that to go. And if Owen Murphy is like his normal self, Barry Nash doesn't beat him at the near post for a goal. It's a three point game at half time, and they're feeling pretty good about life. So I just I can see a world where Kilkenny are like okay. It might feel like we've been humiliated here, but bear in mind, we have bigger fish to fry and we will see this team down the road. Did Were you not frustrated by the way they recycled the ball? They kept going backwards. So while they were making some inroads in the first half, they spent a lot of time looking to go back the field. And I think that's because they don't have that those forwards who can penetrate that half-back line and full-back line. And they were looking for the easier option. Paddy Deegan scored a point from 100 yards. All of their scores were 
between the 45 and the halfway line and behind it. Uh, you need goals to beat Limerick. So I think the fact that they at no point looked like they were going to threaten. I think Quaid brought off two fairly handy saves. But lads, goals need to beat Limerick and Kilkenny weren't anywhere near um, looking like going to score a goal. And uh, that's what my concern would be. And I hated how, how often they went backwards. Hated it. It was like football. And there wasn't really a high press either, Sarah. Like that, Limerick almost walking out from the full back line unopposed. Like there wasn't that pressure that, that you'd maybe like to see. But then again, that, that seemed like a tactic that was decided on before the, the throw in. Yeah, but I, I suppose the, the question there is then where is that bravery going to come from to, to beat Limerick? Because you're going to need that. How come Gillan and Flanagan can stand on top of the opposing goal line, but no other team can actually push Limerick to that level? Because it appears that they need an extra player around their midfield and half back line to be able to, I suppose, give that support because no team can go 15 on 15 with Limerick right now. None. Have, and that's the problem. Have some teams lost to Limerick before before the game starts? Like, is there a fear there? We, we spoke about fear this morning. Jer said fear doesn't exist. Now, we were talking about the bank holiday Sunday fear. To be fair, it's something different. But in terms of Limerick and teams preparing to face Limerick... I think Limerick, I said it's made up. But made up, on. it's made up. Well, there are different things. Is fear when it comes to playing Limerick made up? Or, or is there a genuine, almost psychological barrier up playing this Limerick team at the moment? No, I, I think the only issue is that is that inside full, full back line. It's it's just that, do you have a quality six forwards to be able to cause them problems? And I know I've been quite negative about Waterford over the last few weeks, but is it the pace that Waterford have and that and that breaking the lines and and being able to penetrate that half back line and full back line? Are they the only team with enough pace to be able to take them on? Because Kilkenny didn't look like they had six forwards who were able to test each one of the backs. Um, in other parts of the field, I think teams do have the players to be able to take them on, but I don't think the six six backs can be actually, I suppose, challenged sufficiently so that there isn't that overrun, that Barry Nash doesn't have that freedom to go up and down the park that he did yesterday. He took his chance pretty well, all the same. Um I, I, is there a world though where uh, fully fit Walter Walsh, fully fit TJ Reid, and all of a sudden the game is a bit more balanced? Look, and we are clutching at straws here. I, I do think that there's a, an element of um, Terminator Two to Limerick at the moment. They can reform in whatever form they want. They can they can mimic you. They can. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to bring up was the quality of their hand passing because we we keep talking about the quality of their stick passing. It's unbelievable. You know, it's right out where everybody needs to be. But they were throwing the ball around like um, like the Lakers. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, some of the throws were... Actual throws. <laughs> actual throws. And it, now the only person uh, in the first half, I think Keane Lynch, an exquisite hand pass in the first half. And I, I mean exquisite by the fact that it was a noticeable hand pass. Everything else is on the line. And I think they really need to clean that up because it's very frustrating to watch. It shouldn't be part of the game. And uh, that's the only thing that I would say about it is their hand passes leaves a lot to be desired. As in it, uh, from a legal perspective, because it, it's incredibly accurate. They were getting out of um, tight corners where you're like, oh, this is really good pressure, very physical, very intense. And then all of a sudden the hand pass goes and uh, they're back and they're free and there's a point. And you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, but lads, it's, it's, it's on the edge. You're, you're not like some some of them are genuinely trolls and it's you, there's not a clear uh, movement from from the from the palm through and uh, d don't like to see it and it is creeping in with the team because they are moving that so quickly they are you know so they, they definitely have to clean that up and yeah. is it up to the referees to clean it up or is it up to them to like not use this anymore I think there was at least four different times in in the game on on um, Sunday when it was when it was the, when they were pulled back. So the referee certainly is more cognizant of it, and you know that's the crowd were getting irate over it. That and the fifteen wides that uh, Limerick posted in the second half. You can love your team, but you can be frustrated with your team, Fair and enough. your team can be brilliant. And equally, Jesus, the groans out of the Limerick fans in the last ten minutes were uh, pretty loud and. It was a surprise because the two lads inside were on fire. So why the lads were pot shotting it from, you know, 10, 50, 60 yards didn't make any sense. Trying not to run up a score on purpose, maybe. Um, <laughs> just to, I don't know. They, they I don't think that's it. I know Garo Tegarty had two mad, you know, long range point, like efforts, we'll say, right? That that didn't come off. But then Dermot Burns, an exquisite point. I don't know if you remember it, lads. He just, it the whole 
the stadium gasped. There were some exquisite moments, but then you've got the madness mixed in and that's league, isn't it? They are better, undoubtedly, than they were this time last year. And look, you know, pending any injuries in the Munster Championship, but they seem like they're more capable of dealing with those. A, a much deeper squad than we even thought they would have at the start of the the season. So if anything, they look even more entrenched as the number one team by a distance. Yes, but if you consider their slow start and we said that that's possibly down to the number of changes that occurred in the first half, um, it took them 16 minutes to find their rhythm. Would that suggest that the players that they brought in are still not at the level? So they do need everyone, like you know, the 16, 17 players who are tried and tested um, if, if they were to have injuries or if they were to have to do without the likes of Declan Han and Kyle Hayes, Tom Arcee didn't start, Will O'Donoghue. And it took them that amount of time to get into games. Would the likes of Tip and Waterford really punish that? All right. We'll leave it there, Sarah. Great stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Bye. Sarah Dunham, giving us some thoughts on the Hurling League final. It is Tuesday morning here. We are still reflecting on the weekend because it was absolutely sensational at 8.45. Cahal Milani is with us. Cahal, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, uh, lads. How's it going? Yeah, it was a great weekend, wasn't it? Two and a half hours of New York, Leitrim. Oh, so good. <laughs> so, so good. Um, Midnight football. Oh, like it's a big story. I think that could be the story of the championship. Um, by the time everything concludes at the end of it all, it's such a huge win for them and a breakthrough. And look at it, it was coming. It was coming. I mean, they, they probably would have felt that they should have beaten Sligo last year. They've run Roscommon close. Um, they had a good team this year where, you know, Johnny Glynn and Owen Karen, I thought, were both really excellent uh, on Saturday night, both with inter county experience with Galway uh, in hurling at football. And um, it's a huge win for the diaspora in general. Uh, it's going to give them a huge boost um, to develop homegrown players as well and raise interest and profile. So it was a match that had just literally everything, literally everything. And uh, to conclude in penalties is difficult for Leitrim and it's a blow for them because, you know, they weren't far away. I mean, you go back three, four weeks, they were looking at promotion from Division 4 probably and uh, hopeful of a conic final place and and suddenly now they're they're trying to rebuild for the Talchon Cup. Well the real in the years don't they they always throw in the All Ireland hurling and football finals but they'll have to add in the New York game I yeah. think to the to the twenty twenty three version. Are you nervous as a Sligo man? Is there a um, possible Yeah of course. I mean it's it's a huge banana skin. Uh New York coming over with nothing to lose and as I say they probably should have beaten Sligo over there last year in, in Gaelic Park. Um, but I think Sligo are probably further on down the road. I think they they were fairly impressive against London on, on Saturday and got the job done comfortably enough. So you'd be hopeful from a Sligo point of view they can get the job done. But um, for New York, I mean, as I say, I think it's the story of the championship or it will be uh, one of the top stories of the championship. And um, they will have another game, I think, in the Talchon Cup, at least if they lose to Sligo. Mm. And if they win, they're in the All-Ireland uh, group stages, of course. So it's huge for them, huge for them. Um, yeah, I, I was saying earlier on, I'm not sure it would be great for them to be in the All-Ireland, Sam McGuire, much better for them to be in the Talchon Cup, but I think they should start making the case to be in the Talchon Cup proper as opposed to, yeah. they don't get through to the Talchon Cup group stages the way everybody else does, they only get through to the preliminary quarterfinal, which again, seems kind of unfair if you're trying to get them into a routine of playing games. Yeah, I guess there's probably a cost issue and, you know, stuff like that. Turn out the GA can afford it though. Yeah, and probably logistics as well in terms of players having to travel such long distances. Um, you know, but I, th- I just wonder then as well, I was thinking afterwards with New York making the breakthrough and, and obviously London have been in the Connor Championship for a while. There are Irish people in clubs all over the world now could you see a case where, where other areas in the world might come into the championship in some shape or form or where there's a, a preliminary championship to earn a place in in provincial championships you know there's obviously a huge Irish contingent in Australia and in other countries and, and maybe that's the way the game is going to go over the next 20 or 30 years that'll be quite the trip for the <laughs> preliminary round down to yeah. Sydney um, the Masters obviously uh, Roy McIlroy the news is, has come through this morning that he's pulled out of the next designated event on the PGA Tour, yeah. um, which is the RBC Heritage. And he didn't pull out in time for it not to be scheduled to face the media today. Uh, so everyone's like, oh, what's going on? Like, oh, he's not, he's not coming. Yeah, so we, have, we don't know what's going on here, do we? Yeah, it's, it's slightly bizarre. Um, no one knows what the reason is for his withdrawal. You know, you have to presume that it's just frustration and, and just a little bit gassed out after the Masters and, and everything that that took out of him. He was scheduled to talk to the media today, obviously, which would have been a, a post-mortem, really, of what went wrong at Augusta. So let's see what happens. The interesting thing about it is he's already missed a designated event already on the tour, and you're only supposed to skip one uh, of the designated events. And given McElroy's standing uh, with the tour, it's a little bit of a surprise from, from that point of view and how strong he's been in s- supporting 
forward to the PGA Tour over the last year, but you can only guess that that he's obviously hugely disappointed after last week. And I guess it shows his performance at Augusta just the the impact of the weight of history on on the shoulders of everybody. So it is. is it psychological for for Rory? It, 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 it probably you know it has to be a huge element of it. I mean, the talk in the lead up to the tournament was how well he had played at Augusta in practice rounds, and you know obviously he had shown form in in regular events as well, but just didn't happen in the tournament. And then you compare that and contrast that with John Ram, who had the lead on on Sunday, and you know was was the champion elect really from from the first six or seven holes and had to negotiate a main corner and really didn't miss a shot when he went through that part of the course which is you know where a lot of players have come unstuck in the past so he got the job done in, in such uh comfortable circumstances really you could say uh you know McElroy could you see him being in that situation uh given his rac- record now at Augusta in the coming years I mean every year it goes on it's going to become harder for him, you would think, to, to deal with the emotional stress of having the opportunity to complete the Grand Slam. I agree. I, I, think, I think that um, I, there was a bang and now or never off this. Uh, that's what I felt like. Obviously, he, he could still have one of those weeks where the older golfers get on it. And um, given his athletic profile, I think he's going to be able to do that until he's mid to late 40s. Mm. Um, Turns course. out playing 54 holes and earning loads of guaranteed money doesn't make you a bad golfer. Like No. Phil and Brooks. No, they did all right. Anything else? Yeah, well, busy night last night. The League of Ireland bowls uh, six points clear this morning after a 1-0 win over Derry City. Shamrock Grove was up to third. 3-0 winners over UCD. St. Pat's beat Drogheda 3-1. Shelburne 2-1 winners over Sligo Rovers in Cork City. Beat Dundalk by a goal to nil. Man City in Champions League action tonight. They played Bayern in the first leg of their quarter-final tie kickoff with that one at eight. Uh, Leicester City turning to Dean Smith try and keep themselves in the Premier League he's been appointed as manager until the end of the season and uh, in the early hours of this morning or tomorrow morning rather the Republic of Ireland play the United States in an international friendly half 12 kickoff time Irish time in uh, Missouri and Ken Doherty missing out on a place in the World Snooker Championship after 10 frames to 6 defeat to China's Pang Zhengzhou last night Antrim's Jordan Brown in action later against Xi Jiawei Alright good stuff thanks million for that and uh, you can hear more from Kyle across the day of course on off the ball on News Talk, it is eight fifty one. If you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number, or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We're saying hello now to uh, Mars Brosnan of the Irish Examiner to talk about the weekend's Gaelic football action. Great of Mayo to voluntarily uh, be the guinea pigs when it comes to is it better to go out of the championship early in the um, uh, provincial championship and, and have that extra time to prepare for the round robin? We're going to find out. Exactly, yeah. The I think the bar, the last time I spoke to you, Jar, we said the bar was just, please don't be boring. And uh, Mayo skipped over that bar uh, very happily. Um, I, I I think the, just one thing on that, right? I think it has been, uh, and I know I, I'm kind of on an island about this, I don't think it's insignificant to be a third seed the more I look at it. Just from a, no, I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world by any stretch of imagination, but if you're the third seed, it means you're, you're guaranteed, to, I, I don't know if people understand this, it's been preordained, you're guaranteed to play seed one first. So in an ideal scenario, it would be easy to say this in hindsight, but in an ideal scenario, Mayo will end up in a group with Dublin and the Ulster runners up and suddenly you play seed one first, you play seed two second and that's coming off the back of a loss, that's two big games and there could be a bit of jeopardy, which is what we all want out of that round robin. So I don't think it's the worst, I don't think it's an ideal scenario to be at seed three. I also think it's the worst thing in the world and a six-week block now, I'm sure, they have enough expertise within that coaching setup to, to manage that perfectly. So from their perspective, they might look at it and say, we'll be in the exact same boat as uh, Ross Common or Galway, whoever loses that semi-final. We're all, we're all going to be third seeds and it's not the worst thing in the world. At the same time, I don't think, I wouldn't just dismiss it as being totally irrelevant either. No, I, 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 um, it's not ideal. I think uh, there's no way to get into the round robin um, I, in many ways there's no way to get into the round robin in an ideal scenario because you've no guarantee that your best players aren't, aren't going to get injured from the extra games but at least they will be rested and so just to, to uh, spool out those fixtures um, let's say let's say it's the Dubs who are the Leinster champions and let's say is it potentially then Ulster runners up there's still one more match for them against the fourth seed and if they win that they'll be through to the preliminary quarter finals is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. The only thing is, though, if you if you go through as a third seed, you have an away preliminary quarterfinal then. Right. So that 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 preliminary the the wild card weekend will be an away game. 
Um, okay, against a, another team. Well, a second seed, yeah. Uh, okay, the second seed will have to come through. Uh, they'll have to have survived. Okay. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how those fixtures all work out because at the moment, the uh, second seeds could be uh, Clare or Tip or it could be Louth or Meath on one side. It could be Cavan or probably Armagh. Mm. Any number of teams in Ulster, yeah. Yeah, just before I get a lot of angry feet, Clare or, or Limerick. Limerick, obviously. Clare Limerick, last sorry, year. sorry, yes, yes, yes. And yes, Dela. Yes. <laughs> and Dela. <laughs> I'm sure they're back to themselves. Uh, so it's my to my fault. You can you can give give out to me, <laughs> not Morris. I'm just saying, in that scenario, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world for um, for uh, Mayo. However, if they've lost two games in the round robin, then I think it's uh, you know uh, very difficult to see them um, making a comeback from that situation. So, how do they lose this? How do they manage to get it so badly wrong? Or do we just need to say, hang on a second, this is actually all about Ross Common? Uh, well, I think Ross Common are they're a perfect example for me of a team who know exactly what they're about. Every single player is on the same page. They know how they want to play. They're more than content, as you saw at the weekend, to drag it down into the trenches and make it kind of um, a really controlled, managed game. Even small stuff, like I heard you talking earlier about their game management. I thought that was particularly interesting in the first half. Just the fact that their goalkeeper was going to take his time over kickoffs and didn't care if their crowd was on his back and they were in no rush to, to get the ball back into play, playing into that breeze. Um, they Kind of get that they flood that forty-five zone, then hit with a venom there. I thought Enda Smith lads was was absolutely outstanding. Surprise, I have to say, when you consider that twenty seventeen, uh, Enda Smith, you had an incredible year that year, and then Stephen Rochford was the mail manager. He was on the sideline again and sent Lee Keegan after him, and broke Ross Common's hearts. And it just happened that the man whose heart he broke was Kevin McStay was on the sideline for Ross Common, and they didn't seem to man mark him at the weekend, which was which was interesting. But yeah, I did Ross Common, I. I agree with you. I think Ross Common deserve a huge amount of credit rather than it may all go totally amiss here. They just, they said it, I, as we said after the Galway League game, they, there was a template here, try and take away their kicking game, force them to, to carry the ball, seeking that work. Um, maybe get the, the rub of the green with a couple of calls within that, but by and large, I think it was a, a well-justified result for, for Ross Common. Conditions notwithstanding, Morris, I mean, it took 20, uh, 25 minutes for Mayo to score their first point from play and we saw that was a, an issue that, that cropped up in the league final as well, only four points from play across the across the match. When you look at the, the inside line for, for Mayo, Tommy Conroy and, and uh, O'Donoghue, Murray and Stack picked them up and, and performed, I thought, brilliantly. I mentioned Brian Stack earlier, someone who, who stood out for me in that Ross Common defensive line. Is that a concern, that Mayo lack of scores from play? Because Davy Burke clearly said afterwards that was something they pinpointed. Well, it was a dog of a good day for a, an inside forward, Shane. You know, it's not a day where you, it was a defender's day, especially on a, a wet afternoon like that. In saying that, um, Tommy Connery probably isn't fit. I thought if that that early chance, they'd kind of two goal chances in the first five minutes, when, especially when you have a team coming like that, determined to spoil the party. The same thing you could be said for Leitrim. You kind of want to put football out of their heads early, try and get take those early chances and don't let them, don't give them any sense of spirit and a cause, but that obviously didn't happen. Uh, I don't know. Is it? Like you, I don't know. Is it a, a major concern that that it, they do have a nice balance within there? But I do. I do think you learn a lot more from your your losses and your wins. I, that's it's a, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. And there was definitely stuff that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks within Mayo that they learned from the weekend. I, I think they have a big problem in midfield now, um, and it'd be very interesting how they fix that because they don't actually have depth there without going and plugging holes from elsewhere. You know, you'd have to go missing with your balance of your half forward line, or I don't see. And reverting to, they've got a couple of handy twenties, but I don't see them turning to that. So there's a, there is definitely there's a lot of them to work. I'm not saying this result was insignificant, but that stuff you don't take that in isolation from the weekends. That stuff come back over the last couple of weeks, and I think that that forward line, if you can get Ryan Run, who Aidan O'Shea and Tommy Conroy all fit, throw Killian Conroy on top of that, I wouldn't. Uh, that's not where I'd be pointing the finger. Uh, is one of the potential solutions in midfield to get Conor Loftus back into midfield and maybe put somebody more defensive minded as the six? Uh, potentially, yeah. That's, I, I think that's uh, an interesting. That I, it's funny, right? Because you know, Mayo, for all the experiment that they did, they actually kind of had their pillars and didn't do a much messing around with them. Like Loftus at six, Bar Doherty played there against Monaghan, but that was kind of firmly established. I think it, the plan was McBride was going to be the fullback. He obviously got pulled out before throwing. Uh, I, I think their big problem there is um, Matt Ryan's form has not been good for a while now. And I think he's 
there were, you know, I would have said previously he was a, a natural rival to Brian Fenton. I don't think that was an exaggeration in terms of his natural ball skills and his athleticism. But uh, they lost the battle, as we mentioned, that in the Smithing, they lost the battle in midfield at the weekend. They lost the battle. I talked to you about this previously after the Galway game. It was probably the only line Galway got right that day. Um, and you go back, and this is becoming a team probably since the 2020 All Ireland final in Crow Park, you know, big days in Crow Park. Um, you can go through the games in, in 2021, to, right up until the, the Tyrone game. Uh, Conkle Patrick took particular joy, I think, in, in rubbing it in the face of then football podcast host uh, Andy Moran that, that he got that battle right. Uh, you go forward a year later, even the, the last two games in 2021, Kevin Feely from Clare was man of the match that day, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was against Mayo. David Moran probably had his best day of all uh, last season against Mayo midfield. It's been a, it's a consistent team. So I, I don't think anybody is... I wouldn't listen. If somebody's saying he's not, he is playing well, I, I don't think there's any truck with that. So you've got three options. You can take him out of midfield and maybe play him as a, as a half forward, try and get him back in form. You can take him out of there entirely and try and plug somebody else in there which, whether that be Loftus or Jordan Finn seems to me like a natural midfielder and he'd be a fine partner for, for Jim and O'Connor who's doing that sort of defensive work. But then you're, as you mentioned, you're plugging a hole elsewhere. Who's going to play six? What are you going to do with your half-forward line then? If you take Jack Haney out of there, do you have a natural 11? Is an option to, we just mentioned those four very talented inside forwards. Could one of them come out and play 11 like Brian O'Donoghue or Kelly O'Connor? And that's a lot of, that's a lot of reconfiguration for a team that looked to be on top of the world. So I'm not saying you, you tear the paper up, but they're definitely even when they were winning, this was an issue. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to see. What Mayo now need to think about is there's every prospect they're playing, as we mentioned, a seed one, a Dublin or a Kerry next. Now how are you gonna how are you gonna match up with them? Yeah, and that's that's exactly the, the that's how you get everybody back in into training over the next couple of weeks and just remind them that there is a massive opportunity for them. And ideally that, that game is that game a home game or an away game? Is that designated? Or is that sure, potentially actually, Croker? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't think that was clarified. But uh, okay. the other answer is I don't know. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was Roscommon and uh, going long on their own kickout. Um, there's two things we want to talk about were Roscommon. The fact that the backdoor cut was so successful for them, which is remarkable, really, considering Mayo have loads of people who can diagnose this, um, and maybe that's the, the Mayo's inexperience in their full back line and the, the lack of championship minutes they had. But again, that's the type of very quick. You, you get blanched in, in boiling water and you, that never happens to you again as a defence. The other thing is going along with their kickouts, um, high risk, high reward, and it totally worked out for them. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. After Mayo played Roscommon in Dr. Hyde Park in the league, uh, I could see Davy Burke running around doing all his media and we were sitting by the side of the pitch waiting for him. And eventually he came down and uh, I, I asked him, you know, you seem to be an anomaly. You're the only team who basically go long on all your kickouts. They actually played Galway in a league game and with 100% of their kickouts, they went long. They never once went short. And that was in, as I'm sure you know, that was in difficult conditions in, in South Hill, but they were just determined to do this. And he looked back at me like I was the mad one and everybody else is mad and they should all be doing exactly what, what he's doing. That The only way you're going to score goals, he said, is, is that first phase. Uh, your best chance of doing that is by not... You know, if you go short, you're inevitably you're running a ball. And if you're running a ball, you're going to meet that... What Ross Common did, what Claire did to Cork, that for kind of big body of players at the 45, and it just lessens your chance of, of getting goals. And Ross Common and Davy Burke seems particularly determined that they will get goals. That was the winning of the game, those taking those two uh, chances. So they just decide to, to go off that. Now, it, even if you look at it statistically, it, it paid off for them. I think they scored one three after their kickout uh, at the weekend. They conceded two points, so they're they're in the plus column there. Um, now. It, on the flip side of that, you'd see other teams and they get absolutely cleaned out about that. But Ross Common seem determined, even if they don't win that ball kind of first phase, they don't have you know huge fetchers, they'll spoil and they'll make it really difficult. And Keith Doyle, I think, is a great find in midfield. I thought might maybe missing Ulton Harney would end up costing them, but I didn't see this kid coming and being as uh, as ready for intercounty football as he has proved to have been. So but while it's working to stick with it, there still is <laughs> there still is part of me that, you know, will, will wave around my my charts and numbers and say it's, Statistically, you kind of do need to mix it up and there there still is a place for, for a short kick-up. But while it's working, it, it's hard to refute it. Well, I think to your point, that it, and probably it, it wasn't 100% this time. Um, so, uh, Keane Johnson was doing some stats for us. They're slightly different from yours, but not not much. He had won four from their own kick-out. But they had 18 kick-outs, long with 13, short with five. Mayo had 17 kick-outs, and went long with five and short with 12. So, the almost exact inverse. And uh, it meant that Mayo were slogging everything all day to try and get through and the three or four times that you know uh, we only need to get lucky once uh, 
they only got lucky a couple of times and it, they kicked one three one four off that. Yeah, and this so I, I so certain teams. I think this is really interesting for how you go about uh, your championship this year because you know I wouldn't say to Mayo you know, if you go back to what Galway did to them, for example, this was an exaggerated form of it. But I, I thought this was kind of typical Keane O'Neill stuff. We don't want you to go long, so we're going to drop concede this kick out kind of aggressively. Your full back line will be left open and will flood that midfield area. And in a situation like that, I don't think any of us would say Mayo have to go long. Like you'd kind of be stupid to kick to where you're totally outnumbered and you have to take the short option. So in a sense, you force their hand because you know exactly once they've kicked that ball off short, they're running the ball. They're not, you're not going to be able to get your kick pass off or if you do, you're kicking to where there's a lot of bodies. And that makes it difficult. And Roscommon seemed very content to, to play the game in that terms. They actually did press on both sides of it as well. But even still, and this, I'm getting back to this, coming back to, this is connected to my midfield issue earlier. I don't know if they have enough fetchers there that they would okay. be able to if you were just to lobby it out and kind of gamble you know if you if you wanted to do that at minimum we're not going to concede this I don't know if Mayo have that right but I do appreciate that teams are going after them they did it to Kerry this year as well they really took away their, their ability to go along and they're forcing I think teams want Mayo and Kerry and to a certain extent Galway to run the ball rather than the alternative where you might be more likely to have them open How important is it for a team like Ross Common Morris to, to utilise a bit of a siege mentality like we, we mentioned Davy Burke was in studio with us a, a number of months ago. I was ready to run through the studio wall after he left. He was he's such a, a motivating man and such a uh, exciting prospect in terms of GA managers in this country. He, he talked about disrespect after the match and he said that we were probably disrespected Russ coming during the week. We finished third in Division 1 and that didn't matter by all accounts. Our defensive record didn't matter. Nothing mattered. And he said, I'm sure our boys weren't overly pleased with all the talk. They clearly utilised headlines in whatever way they, they, they approached it. But that was something that clearly Davy Burke held on to. Yeah, for the last decade we've been hearing about how high performance environments are all about intrinsic motivation and internal stuff and you can't focus on external sources and over and over again we hear people talk about how they utilise the chip in the shoulder to, to devastating effect. Um, David Burke is just the latest in a long list, lads, you go back, Paddy Andrews talked to you about G, about their regard for, for Mayo and the made the media darlings Mayo. Uh, I remember Conor Laverty doing the same thing after uh, Kilku won there at Ireland. It seems to be a very powerful source. So uh, I, I think that was, it's easy to say this in hindsight, I'm sure. I think that was very obvious in how Roscommon performed at the weekend. The way they were celebrating freeze, their, uh, how much the kind of bite that they bring defensively. Niall Daly, and a lot of people will focus on the Dailies and their, their aggression, but he's a very smart footballer too. He was kind of covering that zone. And then he'll bring that that kind of war mentality that you see to, to, to everything. So it very, they very clearly fed into it. it was, you got that sense right talking to a couple of players after. And I think it was part of the idea that we're coming here to we've a grand plan here we're coming here to pull off a heist and the Smith actually said after the game it's very satisfying when a, when a plan comes off so they clearly had a circle around this I'm sure that stuff all fed into this idea that we're going to come and uh, do exactly what they did four years ago Yeah if Michael Jordan's taking stuff personally I think it's, <laughs> the rest of the world can maybe uh, learn a little bit about competitive spirit from him um, we should briefly and we'll get into this over the course of the rest of the week and we get the opportunity to talk about everybody again because it's only the start of the championship but uh, Clare's victory over Cork is really really significant for that Clare team for Colm Collins you know who has been slaving away for years and years and years and at every moment it seems like where they were just about to get this breakthrough it didn't happen for them and it's not over yet they obviously still have a, a tricky semi-final as we pointed out to get through but um, it's a huge huge moment for Clare football Massive, yeah. And it, again, talking about cliches, it's become a, a cliche to praise Colin Collins. But if you took a look at what has happened here, the, as I mentioned earlier, I think you learn a lot more from your losses than your wins. I thought it was really interesting that Colin Collins said after the game, he was actually thinking, it was in his mind what had happened against Kildare and Dublin coming down the stretch there where you know they didn't score for the final 20 minutes uh, against Dublin. They ended up losing that by one. They were six up. I think they scored one point in the final 20 minutes against Galera. They were also six up and lost that by one. They were two, within two points of Cork in the league. So like Unclear kicked a free in 48 minutes and then it just it totally un unravelled after that. And the best case of what good management is, is is learning from that. So they were totally rootless at the weekend, you know, making a change at midfield at, at half time for Carl O'Connor had a kind of a poor wide right in front of his goal and, and he was pulled. Um, Gavin Cooney started both of those games. He came on, kicked a great point on his left foot coming on the loop. And beyond that, the way they worked that that final score, the clarity, talking about a, a team being on one page, that's a goalkeeper storming off the field. You watch Kidding Iran, it's from that moment on, 
it's runners from everywhere and he finds himself in, in an ocean of space and, and taps over. I thought it was it was just great coaching. It's again another team that know exactly what they're about. Like they um they're very, very, very defensive, I have to say. They really do flood back kind of hyper aggressively. And Cork played into their hands. They did a thing that we would have seen ten years ago, never really engaged that zone. First ten minutes were shooting from outside it, Fahi on a driscoll two kind of bad wides from range that uh, if you have a Jeremy Connolly and a Paul Flynn, that'll work to a certain extent, but uh, I was surprised that, that that Cork resorted to that, but from a Clare perspective, it's a it's a massive result, and probably goes to show as well that for all the the talk around what's happening across the, the board here, the margins are very fine here, Jar. Like you go back to the league, I know they were relegated, but they had two very close results there, and now they finally get the rub of that on the flip side. So I wouldn't be, I don't think, I think I saw something there this morning. I don't think Cork are in crisis either here, but I definitely do think from from a Clare perspective, it was a it was a massive result. Should give a quick, uh, very quick mention, Morris, to, to Armagh. I mean, it was a disappointing end of the season for or to the league season for for Kieran McGinney in relegation, and they were disappointing in the last couple of games as well. But Conor Turbot was brilliant, I thought, in that in that weekend win against Antrim, uh, and now it's a big, big Ulster quarter final against uh, against the Cavan, I think it is on that side of the draw. So, I mean, I don't know where Armagh are at. It's hard to tell. Maybe after the weekend, but they certainly were were impressive. Yeah, I have to say, Shane, I I think Armagh are in a a fairly good spot. Watching a game like that at the weekend, I know. It, Opposition taken into account and all that, but I might have have no excuses, lads. Like they have so much talent. They just watching Ben Creeley being back in midfield. The amount of turnovers that guy has, Mister Gadget Arms. He's just so good at getting a hand in and turning over the ball. He's a great kick out option they have there. Um, you mentioned Connor Herbert. I he is an electric footballer. He's kind of eight points. That's without you. You, you flash to the stand. You see Reno Neal and Andrew Mernon up there. Uh, no Jalio Burns. Kieran Mackin is a. I think he could be a very special footballer. He only made his debut last year, but. You know, when you've a guy doing as much damage as he's doing, it was interesting. They seem to be taking on water all sides, but Andy Mackey, the first thing he does after 20 minutes is pull their, their wing forward and send somebody onto onto that wing to try and curtail his influence. They've got, yeah, I think they're they're mo- moving in the right direction. Probably would have been critical enough for the way they set up at times in the league, but they kicked an, enough ball at the weekends. Again, opposition aside, but if they stick to that, um, what I'm saying is I think in terms of on paper anyway, they're in a very good spot. I don't I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be in a, an Ulster final. All right, we we'll leave it there, Morris. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks, lads. It's Morris Brosnan of the Irish Examiner. Give us some thoughts on the weekend's football. And as I said, we'll obviously be talking about anything that we didn't cover there. So hold your wish, giving out to us about not getting to your team. We do love you just as much as everybody else. Don't worry. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. If you want to get in touch, you can leave a comment in the YouTube stream. Some highlights from the OTB Podcast Network for you: the Football Pod, uh, looking back on uh, a, a decent opening weekend of the championship all the weekends GA reaction pods uh, you'll hear Debbie Burke talking that one and also GA rugby and football pods from this morning show you can follow us across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTV podcast network after these we've got Alan Quillen in the studio talking rugby you're listening to OTB AM OTB rugby I've been a big supporter of Ross Byrne over the years I believe in the young man I just admire how he's handled himself and how he's gone about grabbing his second opportunity is really admirable and I think inspirational. If Ross Byrne had an Australian grandmother, he would have 60 or 70 caps for the Wallabies right now. Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now. Fighting Words, Ukrainian Action in Ireland and the Irish Red Cross have come together to host an exciting concert by some of the best-loved artists from both Ireland and Ukraine at Vicker Street on Monday, 24th of April. Come show your support with more than 20 great Irish and Ukrainian artists, including Glenn Hansard and Callum McInumra, Kathy Davy, Roddy Doyle and Paul Muldoon, all taking part in support of the millions who have been forced to flee Ukraine. A concert for Ukraine at Vicker Street, Monday, 24th of April. Tickets on sale from Ticketmaster at just €25 Euro, or go to Vicker Street.com. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Right, 13 minutes past nine. Alan Quillen is with us this morning. Um, this is uh, Leicester head coach Richard Wigglesworth. It feels like a long time ago now, but it was, uh, it was only Friday night. They are an outstanding team with quality internationals and quality coaches that have been together a long time. None of that's in question, but the gulf is in what you have available to spend. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. No, I'm just asking. I'm not asking to spend more money. I'm just being clear. Uh, so, no sour grapes from uh, Leicester here. Does he have a point, or what's the story? Does he have a point? Um, depends what way you look at it. Because if you look at the team that played on Friday night for for Leinster, 
a lot of those players would have been on centrally central contracts which are, are covered by the system here the IRFU essentially is control all four provinces yeah so you're talking about player budgets and um I think the model that Leinster have, and we say it a lot, is is the envy of a lot of teams across Europe because it's sustainable, um, big crowds, lots of interest in sponsors coming in, getting involved, incredibly well run by the staff they have, the quality of staff. I think Leo Cullen referenced that at the, at the weekend when he, when he was asked or after the game, the type of staff they have. And I think that's a big part of quality uh, people running this, the, the environment and and the club behind the scenes. I think they've been very shrewd in, in their appointments there. And that's all the way down to administrative staff and people in medical, fitness, um, right across the board, I think. So they've looked at everything and they've improved all their standards, um, which have, have obviously takes um, a lot of work, planning, and and getting the right people. Um, I think that if you if, if you look at the players on the field the other night, the, the central contracts, if you added up all their salaries, you're going pretty high because, yeah. you know, those players don't stay. When you become an Irish international, you're now, if, even if you don't get a central contract, which is um, the group who are on the top, the top earners, you're still, you're gone from a provincial level up to either that, that gap in between. So the average of that could be... You know, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred maybe, and you still mightn't be on a central contract. So look at Josh van der Fleer for a couple of years there. He's an Irish international, and I think he only recently, last year, was it signed a, his first kind of central contract. So if you add up all the salaries that are night year, yes, it's high. Yeah. For the fifteen players that started that game, you're up over four, four and a half million for for fifteen players in the field. But they're all, you know, they're all. They've all come through the system here and they're all internationals. Leinster's, to clarify, nobody has the exact numbers here and there's no point in speculating. Um, but those players, out of Leinster's playing budget that they're given from the RFU, they have to contribute to the, the centrally contracted player. It's not a completely so free a percentage of the table. Yeah. yeah, there's a percentage. But the RFU top it up and that's the system here. So Leinster, Connacht and Ulster if they were in a similar situation that they had 13, 14 internationals who were starting for Ireland on the Munster team or the Connacht team or the Ulster team, they would get the same support and help. Yeah. Is it an advantage to, against the English or the French? Well, the playing budgets in France are totally different. I think I remember maybe two, three years ago, Toulouse's playing budget was 31 million or something like that. So there's no excuses there. Um, they waste a lot of money uh, on their systems and their structures and a lot of players are on l crazy money over there who are not even international players. Um, the English situation is, did you ever think you'd hear English sporting clubs uh, bemoaning Irish sporting clubs <laughs> in any sport about money, finances? So what about the English school system? Well, what, what do they contribute to Gloucester, to Leicester, to Harlequins, to Saracens? They, they don't have any English schools supporting them. Well, they do, obviously. Of course they do. Yeah. So here's a guy who's bemoaning and he's saying, I'm not giving out about it, but he's but he, having a nice little subtle dig at the system he, here. We're not thick. We can, we yeah. can, when he's and here's he's a guy who played on a Saracens team for a number of years who continuously breached the salary cap. They all had overseas accounts for their image rights. Um, so I don't buy that. Leicester are a club um, who have incredible tradition, um, great club, great history about them. They're paying Henry Pollard seven or 800,000 a year. So their salary, the salary cap in England is 5 million, um, which was reduced from 6 million to try and keep... Because the, the club's, club's keep sustainable, going and they, yeah. yeah, and they lost a lot of money, and the pandemic really hit them. In fairness, uh, more so, the RFU here they had a deficit and lost money as well, but they were sustainable, and they were able to. They had money in the kitty, and they were able to survive basically from a business point of view. But <laughs> Leicester get a lot of players from um, you know from their schools uh, systems as well, and, and English schools by school by rugby has always been very strong. Um, so if you if I think the point to clarify here is the salaries 
with the two teams, the two 15s that started the other night, Leinster's salary is higher. It's higher because they're international rugby players. Well, and they've got to that point. They actually, they're, so, they're not employees of Leinster, they're employees of the IRFU. They're a mixture. So there's, yeah. But basically, the guys in the national contracts, um, again, Hugo Keenan has signed one recently, but Gary Ringrose would be on one, Robbie Henshaw, um, Caelan Doris, I don't know. I think he has signed one. James Ryan, Tyg Furlong, Porter, Sheehan. So they have a lot of players who were, who were on that. Sheehan know, might not be yet, is top, he? I don't know. They're on the top end of, of, of salary. So if Leo Cullen, if Leo Cullen can't and the RFU can't offer... Um, Dan Sheehan, Harry Byrne and Ryan Baird are the latest players to agree new deals with Leinster Rugby was from the uh, and, and, 3rd and, of March last year. And essentially that's not... Um, they're still probably on decent money, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and, uh, sorry, the argument from from people within Irish rugby are going to be, well, they're only they're able to pay those really good money because they don't have to pay everybody market value for the Ireland players. And like, uh, yes, because uh, those players are that's success. So you get into that successful position. So they shouldn't be punished and said, well, and it's also we're the IRFU money. Yeah, like and you, the Ar- and as I said, if it was Le- Le- Munster, Connacht, or Ulster. So, They'd get the same support yeah. as regards if 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 Munster had ten or twelve in current internationals, well, one, the IRFU would want them to stay with Munster, and they'd be, they'd end up some of those guys on central contract, others on higher contracts. So it's changed a good bit, but like there, you can, there is a bit of me that wonders about the chicken and egg element of that as well, where it's more difficult for Munster to get better players because they don't have better players already. Do you know right, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it uh, is difficult. And there's no, how you fix that. there's no denying that Leinster now find themselves in a very strong position where the rich are getting richer. Yeah, there is a bit of that, and you can't hide away from the fact that if Leinster wanted to go out and sign someone um, and get a top class overseas player, and the RFU weren't giving them the budget, that they can find the money. But those they can get sponsors. They can get, you know, certain companies topped up a few salaries over yeah. the years. So, yeah. but I, I don't, I don't. I don't critique them for that. I don't think that they do all work for the IRFU. Ultimately, if you if if you do a deal with Leinster, it's with uh, the the company name is the Leinster branch of the IRFU. Yeah. So somebody somewhere along the way has to go. Grand. Okay, we'll let you go with that. If they did want to sign yeah. somebody yeah. who was a global superstar, it would and it's it's off their official budget. They've they've found a pocket of money somewhere else for it. Um, the 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 point here is they've run. Like they've brought Lens, they've they've they brought the sleep and join to a level that's it's it's sustainable, and obviously, um, if they can keep producing players through the school system, which is unbelievably beneficial to them, and they have an advantage of of the other provinces there. Uh, Dan McFarlane is talking about that demographic situation of of players coming through, um, and and it is uh, you know Leo is talking about hard work, dedication, commitment. One of the big things that I would say about the other provinces is, and in any business, I'm, I don't own a business essentially, and I'm not a kind of in day-to-day business, but I think one of my beliefs in running uh, um, any sort of a business is is quality of staff make, makes a huge difference. Obviously, in a sporting context, you need quality of player. But, I mean... If you're producing young, if you're trying to produce young players, I think the grassroots, and we look at Limerick and the hurling, people talk about JP McMahon is putting money into Limerick and just, he didn't go out and buy players. Well, they didn't piss up against the wall. Structural. And they had to go back and justify where money was being spent, how we were going to set up academies, all that kind of stuff, facilities. And in fairness, I'm not saying that Munster or any other provinces haven't, you know, been working incredibly hard to do that. But I think it's, my point is, it's just a very important part of it. And of course, then finance does come into it. It feels so to me like get a f- have started to get that right in the last yeah, few years. Yeah, I, it's, it's been yeah, a slow I think process. so, yeah. And you can't just get a magic wand and produce um, 10 internationals. It takes time. But I think you continuously have to be looking at how do we get better around our fitness, our nutrition, administrative staff, 
quality of voice in the room who's coming up with ideas to get better all that kind of stuff makes a difference so he, he's referencing that Leo Cullen about the quality of staff it's much easier when you're winning and you're going well and we always hear that in sport don't we the time to, to, to really focus in and zone in on your whole structures when you're winning because the mistake a lot of sporting teams I would argue that Leo gets the credit for doing that when he broke Graham Henry so, over yeah. very early in so. his career so. and, well look at his first year in 2016 they, they won one game in Europe I remember writing an, an article for the Irish Independent at that time, literally going, we could be in for a very barren spell here from an Irish rugby point of view because of money, finances in France in particular. Um, so, you know, they've worked incredibly hard to do that. And they are the envy. They're not just the envy of all the province, all the clubs in France and England. They're the envy of the other provinces here. And... We've got to learn from them. You can't do the exact same thing because they do have a, a, an advantage in, in the school system. And the school system now is producing an athlete at 18, 19 who's incredibly conditioned. Um, they're fit. They know all about diet. They, they're they nearly self-prepping themselves to go straight into their academy and stuff like that. The key here is, and, and one, one thing there's... You know, a strategic plan going forward for Irish rugby will certainly involve some sort of a, an academy system of Irish players that, that there needs to be some sort of... Centralised. Yeah, or, there or needs to be some sort of a... Um, what's it in a... a draft? NFL, uh, yeah, a, a little bit. Yeah. Because I think you, you may lose some, some of the quality. Look at our under-20s for the last two years. And um, I still think there's certain players in Leinster... And I don't blame them in a sense that they shouldn't, they should, they should, should not move. But there's guys in there who who will have to make a brave decision in the next year or two about how long they stay in Leinster. And just and one point on this though, the Dan McFarland thing I wasn't buying, and, and uh, Jonathan Drennan pointed it out in yesterday's Irish Times about John McKee, who's actually from Belfast, who comes yeah. off the bench for Leinster, yeah, and it's yeah. like, well, now that's come on. I mean, <laughs> I, I, one case is not the only thing, but I, I, the demographics, the other thing about that uh, population of Antrim in the last census was 618,000, population of Down, 531. So those two combined is... 1.2 million, roughly, close enough to 1.2. Let's Let don't make the marquee signings. So, like, they can't put me in the say, uh, Rocky Elson type signings. Is that why we should give them a little bit of a leeway? Because, as you say, they're all no, it's, they, it's a lot they of can do them if they, if, they, if they want to go out and get them. They've they've Jason Jenkins, Charlie and Gatai, and, mm. and Michael Ala Ala Toa there at the moment. The Irish provinces are allowed to sign three, so um, they're there three, they're there as backup. Um, Luke Fitzgerald continuously saying that you know they, they shouldn't have anyone in there because. But look, I think um, well, why not? Um, I think they've they have they have more resources. They have more, um, you know. In in simple terms, as I said, their player salaries is quite high mm-hmm. because they have international players. It's lower in in the other provinces because these guys are not playing. How do you get? The other provinces to have more internationals. Well, you need to make sure the system. They've once they they've 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 some incredible talent as well. You know you have to give them. It's it's not luck at a draw, but there's some wonderful players. If you look at the Leinster team at the moment, like you're not just talking about top class provincial players or internationals. You can pick seven or eight world class players out. So, is that? solely down to money it's not money helps in, in, in the systems and the school system helps massively but I think it's unfair from Richard Wigglesworth to come out after the game and start focusing on that um, it's just frustration isn't it from an and, and you know he's, he knows what he's doing he knows what he's doing oh yeah he he's, he's exactly definitely taken he's away doing. from the fact that um, they weren't nowhere near as good as they should have been really like d- well Munster went out and signed two players a couple of years ago for over a million quid, they got outside support for it with Dia Linda and RG Snyman. They rolled the dice and said, look, these guys, and I I thought it was definitely worth it when you have outside support coming in. Um, it doesn't solve the problem. You know, Dia Linda was brilliant. Snyman um, obviously had incredibly unlucky with the injury. They were brilliant players and they could have made a huge difference if Snyman was on the field for a few of those games. And for a period that that period, he would have been brilliant for him. Um, but I think if you're if you're in a level that's not at the same at Leinster, I think your fo- sole focus should your main focus should be how do we find 
quality young players to come through and that we, we can try and Where's develop this system yeah, yeah, that's sustainable and bring our own players through. Sometimes it's just, I, I've said this many times, Ronan O'Gara played for Munster for 15 years. Where's, w- w- since then, um, that's not down to development or, or it's sometimes those players just don't aren't around yeah. and they don't come through. And he was an example of, you know, since he's gone, there hasn't been the same level of of natural ability that's come through like him. You know what I mean? And you could pick other players too. So sometimes once in a lifetime players kind of come through like that. Leinster seem to have a lot of them at the moment, but that's down to a numbers game. It's like putting a hundred players there in front of you that Leo Cullen can choose from at eighteen, nineteen. You put the same hundred in the other provinces, and you you'll just get more quality there because they're playing the school system does help massively but they deserve massive credit Ger, and I'm a monster man who should be mm-hmm. uh, uh, trying to clip their wings here I, I applaud them because they've they changed the whole way of, of how the o- operation runs and Mick Dawson deserves massive credit he's retired now um, he did a wonderful job and changed that whole thing. Check his time. He looked at it as well, got outside the provinces. They got more people involved. There was a time when I went to Donnybrook playing into pros and there'd be you know a couple of thousand people there. There's a famous one down in Limerick where there was a couple of hundred people at a, an into pro game. So it's changed and they have the numbers and they have the support and they have the money coming in the gates. So um, they, they're at a level now that that's is envious. Uh, the semi-finals is a, a question here from uh, does the European Cup get a softer eye considering the one-sided nature of the quarter-finals and the bad beatings of the GEA quarter-finals were all as one-sided we'd be talking about a crisis. Um, I, I think that they've managed to screw the tournament so badly in recent years I think everybody agrees that the tournament is in crisis but notwithstanding that the semi-finals are going to be excellent and uh, we're going to have DuPont and his cohort who were doing ridiculous things at the weekend. Yeah. They also scored 50 points in their quarterfinal against potentially a better team than, than Leicester. I don't know. It's hard to know exactly where the South African teams are. And they looked a bit out in their feet. But um, I think that uh, Leicester might be favourites for that game, but they might not be. I, I, would, I don't make them oh, massive favourites. They, they will be favourites, I think. Um, they'll be very conscious of what happened last year when Toulouse came to Dublin, how they beat mm. them. Um, Leinster started that game unbelievably quick and well like they do they're so difficult to slow down um, Toulouse have an incredible amount of po- power and I think that was a that was a very good Sharks team who played unbelievable some of the tries in that game yeah. were sensational the other day they're heavy favourites for that game with the bookmakers yeah. at this age yeah. I do not make them heavy favourites for that game I think it's much closer to 50-50 well it depends what happens Ryan Baird and, and Robbie Henshaw and um, Van der Fleer James Lowe Van der Fleer yeah. they're, they're they have obviously a lot of quality and depth to replace them. But um, if Toulouse can stay with the pace fit, I think that's the biggest problem Toulouse had last year is, is, is the pace, speed of movement, speed endurance. We saw France and Dublin. Um, this site at Leinster are so fit. It's just unbelievable. They're, like Gary Ringrose at one stage the other day made a tackle, got back on his feet, wins the breakdown. All in, It was like as if he just, it was a spring that just got back up off the ground. They're so well coached as regards their their second, third, fourth involvements, um, and they're so fit and and conditioned that they just never give you a bit of peace. Um, and if you don't, if Toulouse don't actually see that that their speed of movement and their reaction to 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 an energy around clean outs and all that, you you can't solely just rely. They're a very big physical side, uh, and Mafu caused the second row caused. Um, sharks a lot of problem at the problems at the weekend, but it's very b- hard to see beyond Leinster with the run they've had, um, and they're going to South Africa for two weeks. But you're gone. Uh, no, they're gone. I'm going as yeah. well. Yeah, but they're 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 going and leaving. All behind. those players will be behind. Yeah, we were trying to try pick out crumbs from the Limerick uh, performance the weekend, and it's it's not easily done when there's a dominant team like this. But similarly for Leinster, like for a 31 point win in a in a Heineken Champions Cup quarter final, there were some sloppy. Moments at the breakdown, they gave away a couple of penalties. Andrew Porter was guilty, like the Kaelin Doris incident, probably 
I don't know if you, if you agree to that decision, but you can pick out little things maybe that opposition teams can say. Well, there's some modicums of of positivity that you can take from Leinster's. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Of course, and um, you know the turnovers and and some of that sloppiness as you talk about. Um, I think physically is the is the obvious one, and I suppose they're sick of listening to this, mm. and it's probably firing them up to 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 kind of roll their sleeves up more. And I think that's why um, any neutrals will want to La Rochelle to um, Leinster final to see what way that goes and how they react. They're the, they're the two best teams, and um, you would imagine that La Rochelle will beat beat Exeter, and I expect Leinster to beat Toulouse. So that's the final that. Uh, will be incredible in Dublin and there'll be a lot of La Rochelle fans will come over as well so um, I don't know where you can I don't know about these weaknesses you're always going to make mistakes and, and, and have little that'll be down to the opposition players to try and find them easier said than done if your missed tackles are high which they had 14 missed tackles in a game yeah. the other day um, that's not a high number uh, but their scramble defence is is sensational um, their work rate I think one area that they need to be careful is is around the breakdown, the points of entry. Um, I think they need to be a bit squeakier than that because mm. I think there was a few t- times in the game the other night where there was a few side entries yeah. and they've got to be careful because opposition teams will look at that and they'll try and highlight it with referees. Yeah. One or two of those decisions. So um, when are you I off? don't see too many weaknesses. Uh, Wednesday, yeah. So go to see mon- the two Munster games and... Um, Big games. Oh yeah, they are, and they've um, they're real backs to the wall stuff. Really, Stormers. Um, they would have hoped, and every a Munster fan would have hoped. Every Munster fan would have hoped that Stormers and the Sharks won at the weekend, that they could keep their focus on that. Um, but you know, the Sharks are. Let me see. They're the Sharks are are eighth. So you think they have to win their two games and. Uh, the Stormers are not guaranteed the home semi final, so they've got to at least win one of their two games because Leinster or Ulster, who in third, will beat the Dragons and Edinburgh. They've two home games, so that's not good news for, for Munster. Will the travel take it out of the South African teams a little bit? Being up here playing in Europe, I don't know, but Munster, I've got to find something. One thing they've got to stop doing is conceding tries. I think they've scored a lot of tries. But conceding all the tries and being really sloppy, I'm sure, will be have been their focus in the last week. No, it's tricky. We'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the week. Uh, enjoy the trip. Cheers, thanks. The weather will be slightly better than it is here. <laughs> it's nine thirty six this morning. OTB AM live with Gillette Labs. Got the ultimate shave or your money back. The online edition is available now. On tomorrow's show, Champions League uh, reaction to the quarterfinal first legs: Benfica and Inter and Man City against Bayern. We'll have Keith Wood on the show. We'll have reaction to the Republic of Ireland's game against the USA. Kicks off half 12, um, half an hour past midnight tonight and loads more on tomorrow's show. Right now, we leave you with Graham Hunters. You had to be there. See you tomorrow. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. You're so unexpected. You had to be.